Here we go. Going. Here we go. Okay, it says oh. we are live. All are right. we? Well, uh, oh. theoretically, uh, you know what? While we're at it, <laughs> let me see if. I... <laughs> oh, look at that! It showed up on the uh, on the thingy on the thing that I needed. Perfect. Okay, now let's maybe. <laughs> um... <laughs> I, uh, oh, I'm getting a little low. OSP after dark detective tier list. I'm oh, seeing a stream. Okay, good. And I'm, I'm seeing, seeing some I'm seeing, live ladies. I'm seeing peeps, and I'm seeing the fundraiser bar, which is exactly what I wanted. So, <laughs> hello everybody. Welcome to Welcome. our second after dark stream. It's been a hot minute since we did one of these. Some stuff went down. Uh, yeah, I realize that sounds very ominous. This stuff happened. We were busy. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> uh, the regular amount of stuff happening, you know? Yeah, yeah. About as much stuff as one could be expected to experience over the course of, I don't know, three, four weeks, five weeks, mm -hmm, sometime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yes. Just a regular amount of nonsense. Yeah, just some, just some fun, hot nonsense. So, uh, as you may or may not recall from the last time we did one of this, and before I do this, mm -hmm. sorry, just make sure, uh, audio, audio, chat. Chat, chime Chats. off of our audio is particularly uh, um, bad. Chat so is far, saying, I'm not I'm seeing any obvious issues. Let me see uh, again. I believe that, that uh, to the person in chat who's having an issue where they're only coming through the left ear, that is probably an issue with your personal um, earbuds or audio. Oh, is it Are happening sure more than once? Are you sure everybody's saying that? Hold oh, on. everyone's saying Just it? That is probably smidge. an issue Just on our end. Never mind. Ignore um, Indigo's audio tips. <laughs> mm, how confusing. Hmm. We've been uh, playing a fun game called Load Order today because um, <laughs> our usual <laughs> Discord MO is not quite regular. But uh, we are we're making do, you know. We're we're hanging right. Oh, <laughs> well, <this laughs> you get one of us in each ear, like like the angel and the devil sitting on your shoulder. <laughs> I'll be completely honest. I don't mind that. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's it's apparently it's only your audio that's uh, panning to one direction. So I don't know if maybe damn uh that's something in the the input settings with your john going on there um I mean, why hold on i mean yeah red uh, you troubleshoot uh i mean they say like i know there are <laughs> stereo options for this but i didn't use any of them well I just eh, eh. it's just we're, we're trying to bring you that uh five mm. point surround sound to all of your streaming experiences it's it's how uh, we here at OSP aim to our, bring ourselves up to to the industry standard that that we aim to uphold. I I'm in a guys I'm in a weird mood today. I'm gonna just keep talking until red while red troubleshoots. Uh, I will <laughs> I woke up uh, feeling funky and I'm we so are confused. now streaming. Oh, oh why is it coming oh. through two channels? Why can't I change that it's two channels? <laughs> ah. <laughs> All right, you know what, guys? I think you might have to fucking deal with it. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Is hold there a way to pan me so that I'm just coming out of the left ear and then I don't we could know. just be the angel <laughs> the devil on their shoulders? I don't know what's happening. Which one of us is which? Ah. Uh, I could be your good frog or your bad frog. Okay. Two options. All right. Okay. Um. Hmm. Hmm. Do -do. I, oh man, this is really annoying. I like. I want to fix it, but also, do I care enough? <laughs> I mean, I kind of care. I care enough that it's probably going to annoy uh, me. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, it wouldn't be an OSP stream if we didn't kick it off with a nice, healthy dose of um, audio technical issues. And I do not mean audio technica, as in the brand of microphone that I use when recording the podcast. No, no, no. I'm talking about technical issues. It's, uh, you know, it's what we do here. Um. <laughs> All right. When in doubt, I am going to Google it. <laughs> Oh, oh, this Google, is so our annoying. Friend. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh... So we're while well, while we're troubleshooting this, uh, we're we're streaming today because um, partially because we want to, but mostly because we want to uh, take the opportunity to fundraise to help out those who have been hardest hit by uh, Hurricane Ida. My hero fans, get out of the chat now. This one's not about you. This one's about the genuine. Um, effects of natural disasters you know uh, so we're going to be raising money in order to to give what relief we can um, and also to to raid some detectives because that's that's fun and we're having a good time so uh, as we're going here you know 
if you if you have the funds um and you would like to contribute to the cause then be sure to to, to join up in that fundraiser and who knows maybe we'll have some uh fun extra additions to the list later on if we if we get close to some of those some stretch goals so uh in the meantime uh red how's it going uh well i found a panel called advanced audio settings and it's not mm. helping <laughs> wait hold on Ooh. hold on hold on let me think of so- uh just a sec oh guys is oh. this helping can you still hear me and did that work well, uh, i still hear you okay that's good it's just that there's a thing that says down mix to mono Mm. And dang it, chat! Why must you lag? <laughs> Speak, spirit. <laughs> ah. you, you've been doing the speak spirit bit a lot recently. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just end up with a lot of people who are. Oh, okay. Chat says it worked. Perfect. I'm a Excellent. genius. Everything is cool forever. Let's go. <laughs> awesome. So what? Uh, so red. What are we? What are we doing here in this after dark stream today? What, what is our? What is our doing fun here? and? <laughs> spicy uh tier list for this evening well uh today we are going to be ranking some fictional detectives because um i just put out a video like yesterday about (laughs) detectives and i was like hey we should do an after dark stream and you were like yeah let's do it about detectives because it will be on brand and i was like yeah Mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm, where we mm -hmm. are now so <laughs> and that's where we've ended up and that's where we'll stay so uh we've got a, a fun little list back there of uh of mm-hmm. various fictional detectives but i will say last time we did this uh we had this thing where um we had a very simple framework we were working on we were ranking himbos mm-hmm. so we could just say okay what defines a himbo what is the platonic ideal of a himbo and how close are all these people to it and, you know, that was a pretty easy, you know, we, we ended up basically working on three major metrics, you know, hot, dumb, strong, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Uh, mostly how close they are to the platonic ideal of Kronk. Uh, but detectives <laughs> are a bit trickier. So yes. the question becomes, how exactly are we going to define the platonic ideal of the detective and how are we going to measure how these detectives measure up to it? You know, I think that this is going to be one of the more subjective tier lists, just because there are so many varieties of detectives, as you as you discussed in your video on the subject. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. Required viewing for this one. <laughs> do you homework? <laughs> yes. Um, if you didn't read the syllabus, you do have to go back and watch the joke. I mean, who cannot... assigns homework on the first day? Mm-hmm. It's me. It's Professor Indigo. I'm here to assign you a reading assignment before you even get to a syllabus week. But no, um, you know. Uh, the thing with detectives is that it's so subjective as to what kind of detective that you personally enjoy the most that I think that this particular tier list might just be a case of us going to bad for our favorites into whether or not they are. I would say, like, I want a detective to be effective at um, solving mysteries to mm. some degree. I would say that that baseline, if they can't solve a mystery, not a great detective, <laughs> just by definition. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> but what if I love them? <laughs> Consider. <laughs> Yes, so that you know, the the one um, <clears throat> requirement that we might have to have is can they solve a mystery effectively? But how they go about solving that mystery, there's such a, a wide range of strategies there mm. that uh, it might be necess- Maybe we maybe we go by how good at their particular brand of mystery solving they are, or uh, perhaps how interesting they are to watch solve a mystery. But this is a, a, le- a less defined list for sure than the himbos were. This is a, a much mm. wider category we're dealing with. True. All right. Well, I am seeing a lot of familiar names in the chat, so I feel like these mm-hmm, people are mm-hmm. going to be rather pleased, as it were. Yes. Let me just uh, get rid of that. And we are good. Let's see Alrighty. who's first on our list. Oh, of course, of course. Just of a second. Course, of course. Let me see if I remember how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and now we play does red know how to add text to do the detective tier list you're box? gosh dang right i do oh man there's a lot Ooh. of options in here i forgot about that okay it's it's cool there's no need to panic <laughs> everything is chill wow all of the himbo options are still in here <laughs> yes add a new source please <laughs> Ooh, excellent. Ay, ay, excellent ay, already a tire fire okay <clears throat> So, today, for our very first detective, it is Mm -hmm. not a surprise if you have watched my video recently. 
mm-hmm. The detective in question, I'm assuming you're a little bit behind where I'm at. Uh, yes, I... Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, it's Columbo, and he's sitting over the chair as we speak. As he should be. Columbo... I mean, personally, I think he's a shoe in for an S-tier detective, but oh, I, I feel like we should justify that, um, because <laughs> I grew up watching... Col- I, I'm a huge uh, mystery and procedural fan, so for a lot of these detectives, I just love them on basis of <laughs> I loved their show. But Columbo is one that I think actually is both effective at solving the mysteries, in that more or less every episode he solves the mystery, and uh, I think he does it in an interesting way, which oh, is yeah. to say uh, he, has, he has a certain persona about him, uh, he rocks a trench coat, oh, super, and yeah. uh, he, his story, the emphasis is all on him as a character. Is, I, you touch on this in your video, no, it's not about his, he has an outside life, but that's not important to necessarily mm. his story. And I think that that does actually make him a more effective detective because it puts all the focus on the um, detecting part. <laughs> yes, you could say that. Yeah, no, I agree. I think uh, Columbo is a really solid detective in part because he has a near 100% track record for success. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, okay, I will say a caveat. I know that there are more seasons of Columbo than I have watched. I watched the first seven seasons. What happened is there was about a 10-year break, and then they did more Columbo in, like, the 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and no shade on that, but I have read through many entries on the blog Columbophile, and uh, <laughs> that guy doesn't seem very impressed with the 90s run, frankly, so I think we're okay. Um, <laughs> but, uh... Oh, thanks for the $69 donation to Direct Relief from uh, Flando Maltresian. Uh, just wanted to shout out the funny number. Nice. Anyway, Columbo, yes. Uh, <laughs> our boy is, uh, he's a good detective. He, like, actually figures shit out a lot. Um, I, I kind of say a little bit flippantly in the video that, like, Columbo's main investigative method is, like, annoying the people who did the crime. But, like, that's more like an unexpected side benefit. He really mm-hmm. is doing some very solid detective work. Like, he, they, they do this thing where the cinematography will make it pretty obvious when he picks up on a clue and, like, notices something weird or out of place that we saw, like, the murderer drop or dislodge earlier. Uh, and, like, usually you can tell by about the 10-minute mark after he's been introduced into the episode that, like, okay, he knows exactly who did it and probably how. <laughs> he just needs to figure out why <laughs> and prove it. Um, mm-hmm. So... Yeah, I think uh, I think Columbo is an easy S tier, uh, all things yes, considered. He's I would just, agree. He's just real solid. Just a just a solid little Italian man. There he goes. Yes, yeah, he's, he's one of the few characters that I think if you if you if you held a gun to my set at head and said Indigo, you have to cosplay someone right now. I could probably do <laughs> Columbo in a pinch. There's all like right. three characters, maybe. <laughs> Columbo's up there. Ironically, another character on this list is also on there <laughs> for similar <laughs> reasons. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. All right, let we'll me just check who's... Oh, well, yeah, okay. Yeah, possibly the only detective I would think of before Columbo. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, the, another... Uh, a lot of these first ones, because when we, when we make these lists, to pull back the curtain, uh, I just sit in front of a Google Doc and I type everything I can think of that fits in this category. So the first, like, five are usually... <laughs> yeah, they're, they're pretty basic. These are the basic mm-hmm. bitches of the detective world. Yes. So next up we have... Um, Yep. So Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Guys, Elle Woods is not a detective. She would be S tier yes. if she were, but yes, she is Elle not. Woods, if this was a lawyer tier list, I mean, she's got obviously going to be S tier. She's beating but, everyone um, in the Ace Attorney series, and we all know oh, it. Oh, yeah. Look, I love the Ace Attorney series, but if I could play as Elle Woods, you know that ga- game over. Actually, <laughs> you know what? That's Hit me up, uh, whoever publishes the Ace Attorney series. I will license this game. <laughs> <laughs> We maybe may be onto something, but let's talk about Sherlock Holmes because that's ostensibly what we're here to do. Yes. Uh, you know, he's the. If you ask someone name a detective, it's probably the first person that they're going to call out. Yeah. Um, always. And with good reason. You know, the Arthur Conan Doyle stories are iconic. They're a lot of fun. Um, they're often. I don't know if I would say that they're great whodunits, but they're fun to watch unravel. Mm. Uh, and it does not. There is something very weird about the fact that if you actually read some of the original stories, topologically, a lot of them ain't really mysteries. <laughs> like, no, I, I brought up a scandal in Bohemia because it's the most obvious instance, and also it's it's a little bit of a purposeful break from the formula. You know, it's got the same mm-hmm. beginning as a standard Sherlock Holmes. They're chilling, and then this person shows up and is like, I've got a case for you, and Holmes is like, neat, and then runs off to investigate. But after that, it's just like, he's just unraveling what's the deal with Irena Adler, and then by the mm-hmm. end, he's like, Ooh, was I the bad guy in this story? Hmm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so 
you know, it's a bit non-standard. But then, you know, there's other things where it's like, this isn't really a murder mystery. It turns out the guy was just, like, terrible. Or, or you know, the mm-hmm. number of times where basically a young woman comes to Sherlock Holmes and is like, I'm in, in an abusive familial situation. And he's like, okay, time to go kick someone's ass. <laughs> it's like, it's a non-zero <laughs> number of times. It's not a lot, but it's weird that it happened, like, twice. Um, so, For sure. But despite that, Sherlock Holmes is kind of defined by being a really good detective, you know, and um, mm-hmm. he was pioneering this more forensic approach before it was really big, like in the real world. The idea that you could actually mm-hmm. collect a lot of physical evidence from a crime scene and potentially use it to figure out who did the thing. Like, uh, isn't there, there's like a John Mulaney bit about this where it's like, we found a pool of the killer's blood in the hallway. Hmm, gross, <laughs> mop it up. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes was like, hey, wait, before you get them up. Um, so I'd say Sherlock Holmes, absolutely very high tier. I think it would be easy yes. to put him in the S tier, but I worry that maybe he hasn't really earned that spot. We're just like giving it to him because of like literary nepotism. So. Yeah, I think in terms of like reputation, Sherlock Holmes is everyone's go to detective. And I'm not necessarily going to say he's the best detective because he's not my favorite detective of all, all time, but he's been adapted so many times and has inspired so many other detectives. And anyone who's saying Sherlock Gnomes, get out of the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I cast you out. <laughs> Vanished. Uh, but, but I don't know if necessarily Sherlock Holmes himself is an S tier detective. I think he is certainly an easy A tier pick, mm. but. Uh, he, his detective work, um, while for the time was certainly interesting, is not always flawless or uh, easy to to follow in a in a way that a lot of other detectives on this list are going to be. Where it's like you can see their their thought process, you can see how they're unraveling the mystery. A lot of times, Sherlock is like, "And now I will give you the spiel of all the clues I put together that you totally, definitely could have followed this whole time." Mm-hmm. Um, which I think knocks him down personally for me. And there are some Sherlock Holmes variations I do want to say that I absolutely love. Like, there's some really great modern adaptations. There's some me- really great variants that he's inspired. But I don't know if Sherlock Holmes himself, for me at least, is an S-tier detective. Yeah, I'd say um, Sherlock Holmes, he's he's got this slight problem. And I think it might be enough to knock him into A-tier, which is um, mm-hmm. Arthur Conan Doyle sometimes does not really give him enough actual in-story stuff to come to the conclusions he does. And um, Mm -hmm. this has been dissected by a lot of writers because the thing is, like, Sherlock Holmes didn't do this so much, but he did get flanderized as doing it a lot. So, like, like, he glances over somebody and it's like, oh, you've got ink smudged on this cuff and your boots have this kind of mud. I remember the first episode of Sherlock where they did the thing of plugging in the phone and now every time I plug in my phone, I have to think to myself. Yep, exactly. But, uh... The thing is, uh, there's actually a really solid bit unpacking this in, I think, Guards, Guards, the first of the Discworld Guards novels, mm. uh, where Vimes has a very snarky internal monologue about how he's very suspicious about that kind of flippant detective work, where it's like, <laughs> hey, maybe instead of being like a left-handed sailor, uh, this guy just got these old boots to do some gardening in and uh, had a mishap with an ink pot or, you know, whatever, like... The point Mm -hmm. is, there's always another explanation, and Sherlock Holmes often jumps to the correct conclusion simply because it is the correct conclusion, rather than Mm -hmm. going Mm -hmm. through or eliminating other possibilities. So, I think, if nothing else, even though the original Sherlock Holmes stories handle it pretty well, I think the fact that they didn't handle it so well that all of its, like, inheritors and knockoffs and and reimaginings lean really hard onto the I'm a super genius who can, you know, see the code of the universe so I know exactly what's happening and it was a boomerang all along. my mind palace yeah. and reveal to you the answer to this episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think for that reason hmm. alone, it's like, it's like how you can tell that something's like a really good story, but it's not so ironclad that it can't be fully misinterpreted by people and it's like that's kind of a mm-hmm. failing of the story it's like it's like my hot take about 2001 a space odyssey <laughs> um, <Ooh>. which is <laughs> yeah it's a very very interestingly shot movie but because nobody knows what the fuck is happening by the end it's not doing a very good job of telling the story which is a fundamental function of the movie so it's not 100 percent perfect anyway because of that i think i'm confident putting sherlock holmes in the a tier and not yeah. losing too much sleep over it yeah, yeah there Me you go too. my good boy there you go also okay. another detective who can rock a trench coat oh, i'm not yeah. saying that it's a requirement to be a good detective but it certainly helps it certainly <laughs> helps also over 2000 viewers now lovely to see you all this fine Woo! evening 
Uh, all and right. over a uh, thousand dollars raised for uh, yeah. Hurricane Eda relief. Well, guys, thank you so much. You're, you're so generous. We've got so many right. detectives to get through. So again, <laughs> as we're going, yep. we're we're streaming uh, in order to raise funds to you know provide relief from uh, those yeah. affected by Hurricane Eda. I, I will say it is uh, it, the the charity we're donating this to is Direct Relief. They have a bunch of different things running right now. Uh, some of it is hurricane relief. Some of it is COVID relief. YouTube's like giving a thing. It doesn't seem to let me specify which specific branch of direct relief I wanted to give them money to, but um, I think we're good. So it's like everything they're running is objectively good stuff that we should be giving money to anyway. So I think we're fine, but yes, <laughs> anyway. Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. right, let me just add the next text box. <clears throat> yes, of there course, for uh, another another classic detective. One, uh, we're, we're leaning into, in this next one, uh, a category of TV shows that I absolutely adore. Because, again, I grew up watching a lot of mystery shows. That's why I am the way I am now. That's why I make so many goddamn graphics. <laughs> it does explain um, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> ah, being mislabeled. Uh, yes, this falls into the category of BBC murder mystery shows, which have a very specific energy. And mm. I personally love it. Um, I mean, they're also books. That's how I got they're also it. Books. <laughs> I had to look it books. up. Yeah. There are a lot that are not books, but there are a lot that are, are books. Um, Death in Paradise is a great one that's not on this list at all, but is a fantastic watch if you want to go watch a, mm. a fun murder mystery show that's set in like a Caribbean island. It's great. Anyway, yes. that's not related to this next person. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not. The next person we're discussing is Miss Marple. Uh, Woo. Mentioned, in, mentioned in the the trope talk this week, but also she's just you know she's great, she's fun, she's uh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she's a she's a gossipy old lady, and much like Columbo, she frequently doesn't show up until the story's already like really gotten moving, and then she's usually first introduced as like a background character from somebody's perspective, like like one of the protagonists of the book just notices that there's this like old lady with like a smart hat on just poking around <laughs> asking weird questions and gossiping and he's just like oh that's probably not relevant anyway back to my hunch <laughs> um <laughs> anyway so yeah she she's got uh it feels like there's a very specific subclass of detective of like people you wouldn't think would be detectives which feels like the kind of um mm -hmm. trope definition that's eventually going to eat its own tail you know <laughs> like yes it's it, like, oh, it's, uh... it now? <laughs> it's definitely like it's it's a rich area to explore because oh. there's a lot of fun to be had with the sorry, unexpected sorry. person. Chat being just able pointed to somebody out. I'm having to. I'm gonna add somebody to our list. Oh. Somewhat high oh, up. Fun. Don't worry. You won't complain. <laughs> we'll get there soon. <laughs> oh good. Oh no. All right. Uh, yeah. So so Miss Marble, you know, I I think for me she hits that scratches that same itch that Columbo does, where I love the sort of um very down-to-earth way of solving the mystery where and and with a lot of her her mysteries you can you can see sort of how she's reaching the conclusions she is although it's certainly it, it's a more psychological method of mystery solving than perhaps the more um analytical uh sherlock holmes or like ncis type mm -hmm. of, of trying to figure out the forensic clues um i'm interested to see like what your opinion on, on a detective that goes for the, maybe the more um uh character witnessy type stuff as opposed to yeah. um forensic falls on this list yeah well ms marple is in this slightly odd space where again she's basically as good as the universe she's in allows but the problem mm -hmm. is i feel like agatha christie slightly overweighs the importance of psychological profiling because the way that ms marple works to put it in the most uncharitable way possible she basically has this like library full of stereotypes she applies to people <laughs> and then she profiles <laughs> based on that so like mm. there was one called uh i think it's a uh, pocket full of rye uh where she ends up f basically pointing a finger at the killer because uh there was this girl who used to like train under her as like a maid and that girl had the worst luck in boyfriends and th that type of girl always has the worst luck in boyfriends and they're always terrible people so that's why she knew <laughs> that this girl's ex-boyfriend <laughs> must be the actual killer and it, like she was right because of course she was right but at the same time it's like I, I don't know. I feel like Ms. Marple's from, like, a tiny rural English town and doesn't actually have that much exposure yeah. to the, the sparkling <laughs> rainbow of human diversity and experience. I mean, like, again, she's about as good as the universe she's in allows, but taking right. her out of that, her methods, well, they don't work, but that doesn't stop law enforcement from using them anyway, so. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway, you see what I mean? Um, 
Yeah, I think the the sort of weakness of Miss Marple, because she's a delightful character, but mm. because she is so dependent on the situation where she's placed, I think she's a, kind of like a B tier pick for me personally. Um, is again, I, I love her, but her her approach to mystery solving yeah. uh, and her actual detective status are a bit in question. Just a smidge. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I. <sighs> It's weird, you know, like she she's got a pretty good success rate and she's quite an interesting mm-hmm. character. Again, in Pocket yeah. Full of Rye, uh, one thing I actually really like about that book is that basically after she figures out who the bad guy is, uh, she goes back home and she finds a letter from that girl. And it is important to note that the girl had been murdered earlier in the course of the the crime. It was one of those things where of course. the initial killing was its own thing. And then the killer was like killing off his accomplices to make sure that. Uh, nobody could squeal, but basically she sent Ms. Marple a letter about her boyfriend, including a photo of him, and how <laughs> he'd come up with this great plan that would involve slipping this dr- uh, this drug into this guy's tea, but then it turned out the guy died, and she doesn't know what to do, and it's like, wow, Ms. Marple, <laughs> if you'd left, like, a week later, <laughs> you would have just been able to give this to the cops. <laughs> anyway, um... Oh, boy. But, yeah, I think it it's tricky, you know? She's definitely not S-tier, and I, I don't know if I'd put her in A tier because she's on shakier ground than Sherlock Holmes. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I think I think she's buoyed up into B tier just by virtue of being really fun. Like, I, I like how yeah. how nice and kind, but also how shrewd she is. Like, she she's clearly <laughs> designed to be, like, someone who every small town English person, like, knew in real life. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's pretty cool also the Miss Marple mysteries have like a disproportionate amount of like elderly lesbian couples hidden in the background (laughs) of just like these two old ladies who live together and never married and this one dresses kind of butch (laughs) like small town murder mysteries that's fair yeah I I stand by that (laughs) yeah I'd I'd say like B tier at most maybe even C tier if that's what our heart's telling us but uh I think I think she's a solid B. I think I think the the virtues of her character outweigh right. the, the the detractions that are put on her by the limitations of the actual types of stories that she's in. All right, here she goes. Let's see who's up. Oh well, of course. Let me just <laughs> make us a sweet little new text box again. Uh, yes, yes. I think it's another one of those classic detectives that uh, I've seen brought up in chat a few times. So yeah. I'm, uh, excited to talk about this guy. Uh, another one who was in a show that I watched as. <laughs> Another one that was in a lot of books that I read. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and We're he's... talking, of course, about uh, Mr. Hercule Poirot. Hercule Poirot. 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 I can't pronounce Poirot. French, guys. I'm so sorry. Yeah, we, we, need, uh, we need Blue and Cyan in here to dunk on us with their mm-hmm. <laughs> two distinct mm-hmm. pronunciations of French that they insist are completely different. Uh, so, Poirot, the man himself with his ridiculous little mustache. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, he's uh, mm-hmm. he's fun. He's kind of like a reskinned Miss Marple. Like if they were in a mm-hmm. Smash Bros. fighting game, he'd just be like a palette swap of her. <laughs> uh, oh, that, I want that fighting game so bad. <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, in that he would be kind of just like just this odd little man. Uh, he he's not as unassuming as Miss Marple. Poirot is a lot mm-hmm. weirder. Um, he's more eccentric he is would be the yeah. word i think that they would use in the universe yes but he also sometimes gets introduced to stories as like an odd little background character that another character notices in passing and then moves on i think agatha christie just really likes that trope because it's mm-hmm. quite solid it keeps you out of the detective's head so you don't see them putting everything together um poirot is also more flashy than ms marple ms marple often ends her cases by basically going to the local like investigating detective and being like it's this guy here's why go investigate it you smart lad and then leaving (laughs) and it's like a cookie yeah implied that that guy presumably goes off and does all the fun like adventure (laughs) and like actually Mm -hmm. tracking the guy down while ms marple goes home and knits uh Poirot uh, instead gets everybody in a room and explains what happened, which is quite fun. That, that's a very archetypical mm-hmm. thing. Um, oh, I love it. The mm. drama of it all. Oh, yeah. Oh. I will say, uh, having watched some of the uh, BBC versions, uh, which are quite fun and very true to the mm-hmm. books, uh, the first Poirot adaptation I actually watched was uh, the movie they made a few years back with Kenneth Branagh Ooh. as Hercule Poirot. Mm. And, uh, Interesting choice of first uh, well, I, Poirot I mean, I adaptation. wasn't choosing it. I wasn't like, oh, man, you know what I really need today? <laughs> you know what I need to be my first exposure on screen mm-hmm. to this great mm-hmm. detective? It needs to be 
the guy who played Hamlet that one time in the worst mustache I've ever seen sprinting around, even though he's supposed to use a cane. <laughs> that sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, that's all we all need. Uh, whatever. Anyway. No. So, don't watch that movie. But Hercule Poirot <laughs> is a good detective. Uh, yeah, I think I think he's a easily one of the high tier ones for me. I mean, I personally I love the. He, he's a very like classic detective, but I think he's sort of um more archetypical in many ways than Miss Marple yes. is. Well, uh, I think uh, Agatha Christie designed him to be an anti Sherlock Holmes, but accidentally yes. gave him too many of Sherlock Holmes's qualities in the process. Like, mm-hmm. oh, he's kind of eccentric, and it's like, yeah, so is Sherlock Holmes. Poirot judges his eggs based on their size, and Holmes does cocaine sometimes. Okay, we all have our little <laughs> hobbies. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, but Poirot uh, also he does a little more physical investigation. Ms. Marple yes. is entirely in her head; like it's all gossip and talking to people. Uh, and being, like, a trustworthy person for them to confide in. Poirot actually, like, looks for evidence and stuff uh, and hunts stuff down. And he even mm-hmm. does the disguise thing a couple times, although usually he doesn't wear the disguise. He gets somebody else to do it. And sometimes that's even, like, a double bluff. Uh, in uh, Death in the Clouds, the uh, character who he has wear the disguise turns out to be the killer. And he's basically using it to judge how well this guy could pretend to be somebody else. <laughs> Which is, uh, ah, sneaky, sneaky. So, like, Ooh. he's kind of in that middle ground between Holmes and Ms. Marple of, like, he does the forensic investigation, but he also does the profiling. And usually he does, like, the psych profile thing of, like, coming up with the idea and then looking for mm-hmm. who fits it and then investigating that person. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, honestly, I think Poro is a pretty easy S tier for me. Uh, if, we're, if we're going just based on his investigative methods, are, I, I appreciate that they are both... Um, somewhat psychological, but also you can follow the logic in them, typically, when you're going about the mystery. Uh, and I think he's got enough eccentricities to make him fun to watch solve the mystery. Oh, yeah. Even if you're not necessarily following along without the eccentricities um, detracting from his ability to be... Um... He doesn't ever fall into the Sherlock Holmes, uh, and now I will punch my way out, good boy, because today we are going <laughs> for a, a rumble on the streets. Uh, yeah, Holmes is a boxer on the side. They keep forgetting yeah. that. That's why I'll stand by the RDJ movies till the day I die, all right? Holmes yeah, is a boxer. Like, he's a boxer. <laughs> and it's that, cool when he punches people. That's not incorrect. <laughs> Whatever. Um, but yeah, no. yeah, Poirot does not have the option of good old fisticuffs, and he doesn't have a Watson uh, who mm-hmm. gives him the option of good old fisticuffs and also guns sometimes. So... Yeah, I think Poirot is honestly a pretty solid S tier, to be completely honest. I think, like, yeah. at minimum. I think he, he's a, he's a, a but iconic yeah. idea, like a classic uh, mm. yeah, consultant or detective. Oh, you um, know what? I have a video recommendation for people, but mm. I can never remember how to spell this guy's friggin' name. So let me let me just look it up. Uh, of course. Z- 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 uh, oh, why am I? Okay, hold on. Yes, okay. <clears throat> the channel is Alistair Beckett King, and the video is If Your Housemate Was Agatha Christie's Poirot. (laughs) But also watch every other one-minute skit that guy does, because he's terrifyingly good at impressions. (laughs) He's got a Picard impression that scared the crap out of me. All right, that's that. Who's next? Oh, Uh, right, my fun little addition. (laughs) Your your fun little late addition. Uh, I have to be honest, this is one of the medias on the list that I have... No experience with really? other than I know that there was an animated movie made of it. Oh yeah, that was all right, but uh, don't 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 worry about that. Uh, we had like ninety five percent of the comics in my house growing up. So oh. where should we rank Tintin, the intrepid Tintin. boy reporter? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now here's what you got to know about my boy Tintin. All right, he is okay. like one hundred percent like. There's a whole genre, mostly British, but this is French, of, like, boys' media of, like, this is a young boy. How young? Eh! Plausibly anywhere between the ages of 12 and 25. And he's got a full career and an apartment and a job and an adventurous lifestyle. And any young <laughs> lad can uh, can look at this character mm-hmm. and be like, mm-hmm. yeah, that could be me. Uh, so that's what was brain poisoning me. At the tender age of, like, I don't know. Those those comics were on a pretty low shelf. I was probably reading them about as early as I could be reading. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yes, there was an animated movie that came out eh, in the last few years, uh, some years. Uh, it was fine. It was, it was a little bit weird, honestly, because... Uh, did you watch it, actually? 
Uh, I didn't. I watched the trailer a lot. But ah. I, I mean, that's fine. The problem is uh, Tintin had a very stylized art style. Everyone had these kind of like just mm-hmm. round, like beady oval eyes, very classic cartoon. Everyone had kind of exaggerated proportions to a certain degree. Not not crazy exaggerated, but like uh, then they made a 3D animated movie where they were trying to make every texture as realistic as possible. And rather than creating mm, yes. a nightmare scenario of over rendering someone with beady little like Charlie Brown eyes, they uh, they decided to give everyone regular human eyes and almost regular human proportions and then do actual mocap. So it ends up looking like real in the wide shots and then weird in the close ups. Um, <clears throat> oh, you gotta love it. Yeah, honestly, it was a fine movie. Uh, Daniel Craig is the bad guy, and we'll get back to that him. Tracks. Oh, we, um, we will circle back around <laughs> and to I our think, boy Daniel Craig. <laughs> I think Andy Serkis is uh, Captain Haddock, which was pretty solid casting. Anyway, uh, <laughs> is he a good detective? Well, that's the thing. Like, Tintin is an investigative reporter, basically. So, like, mm-hmm. he's not a detective by trade, and yet he winds up doing an awful lot of detectiving and also sometimes going to the moon and dealing with really unfortunate racial caricatures. <laughs> um, well, uh, he went to the moon? Uh, yeah, he went to the moon uh, at one point. I believe there were aliens. He's, he's like friends with this dude called Professor Calculus, who's a sciencey guy, and I believe they went to the moon in a possibly two-parter. Anyway, chat, back me up on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, uh... Tintin is quite good at investigating stuff, but he's not very good at figuring things out, mostly because usually the minute he gets close, somebody, like, coshes him on the back of the head and ties him up and then, like, kidnaps him. Oh, and then course. he's just embroiled in the plot from then on because he's been kidnapped. And that's, like, a once-per-issue, sometimes-twice situation. So, like, that <clears throat> that doesn't really speak very well of his detective skills, but it does indicate that, like, he's at least good at figuring out where he should be going. You know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Why is I mean, Chad so crazy about? Yes, he went to the moon. Come on, guys. <laughs> of course, he went to the moon. You think they could get away with him not going to the moon? Every good know. detective well, worth their salt. These detect- <laughs> <laughs> I would say that most of the detectives on this list have not been to the moon, to my knowledge. Well, we not all of them. But certainly, some of them. <laughs> there yeah. are some who have definitely been to the moon, which is something I didn't think I'd be saying on this particular stream. And then there are some who I most certainly did not go to the moon but i think most of the ones who definitely didn't go to the moon we've actually gone through already so a lot of these other ones are gonna be possible moon men possibly moon men (laughs) some of these i'm almost certain went to the moon okay oh yeah so uh tintin i mean it sounds like i based on the zero information i know everything is coming from the last five minutes (laughs) uh it sounds like maybe a c tier because it, it doesn't sound like he's necessarily like the, the platonic ideal of a detective I and mean, it does seem like there are yeah. some flaws in his detective methods but you you are the expert in the, on this one so I, I will default to your uh well your opinion i mean unfortunately you're right like and here's here's part of the problem again based on the story structure he's in tintin has wacky sidekicks tintin has a dog mm. who never speaks because dogs don't talk but does have a thought bubble that we can read so like we know what snowy's thinking right and he's got his friend captain haddock a perpetually drunk not pirate but basically pirate uh and every once in a while tintin will be like i just can't figure this out and then haddock will like bump ass backwards into a table and something will fall off and break and then the clue will pop out and they'll be like oh brilliant you've done it and it's like okay all right mm. So I think, yeah, honestly, for raw detectiving, I think we can put Tintin in the C tier. Uh, but I do really like him, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we could put him in B tier just for me. <laughs> mm. I can't tell you no, because you control the text boxes. That's true, but I do. Watch, behold my power <laughs> as I wiggle mm. it slightly on the screen. Anyway. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, man. I'm, uh, you know, uh, do what you want. Do all right, all right. He's going in the B tier. Like, I'll put him, yeah, on, right. I'll put him kind of on a line, so, like, there's <laughs> plausible straddle the line. Yeah. All right, we can, okay. We, could, uh, we can pop him down or up, depending on how we're feeling once the boxes start filling up. Perfect. And on the uh, subject of adventurous, youthful detectives. Oh, this next one I do, again, another property that I really loved as a child. Yeah, baby. <laughs> we're talking about Nancy Drew. Oh, yeah, we Girl are. Girl detective. Oh, I love her so much. Much, and yeah. I love those books. They're such a delight. If you are a teen or younger or older or any age and you want to read a mystery, go read a Nancy Drew book. Have a time. You know, the weird thing is, uh, I know we had a bunch of Nancy Drew books, and I'm certain statistically I read them, but I have no idea what happens in them. 
Yeah, I don't think I remember the specific um, mysteries that well, but I remember the ambiance and how the mysteries were solved because I read maybe like 30 of them mm. <laughs> all within the span of maybe three months. Perfect. Um, yeah. Uh, Nancy Drew, I think, is a pretty high tier detective for me. And here's why. I like that, and and part of this is because she oh, is in a, a longer novel. Keep talking. Mm-hmm. Chat just reminded me of another detective. I'm adding it. <laughs> yes, I also don't added worry one about to the it. End of the We're list, good. Uh, which is maybe um, iffy, but I think we should do it. I'm putting uh, mine like <laughs> second to next. <laughs> cool. Uh, oh, okay. Cool. <clears throat> okay. Uh, no. So Nancy Drew. I, the thing I like about her methodology is that, and part of this is because, of course, her mysteries unravel over the course of novels as opposed to short stories or like a tv episode so there's a bit a bit more time that can be spent on the actual mystery itself and she does a lot of direct investigation she's a very active detective Mm. um and while certainly there are times when she gets inclinations based on her knowledge of a person's personality or situation a lot of the times when she actually solves the mystery is because she finds a key clue or actual not quite forensic evidence because a lot of times the clues is like, oh my gosh, the key was hidden in this haystack inside the old sawmill. Wow! But we did go to the old sawmill to find the key. So, <laughs> um, I, and I think that that's sort of like logical, uh, very step by step unraveling of a mystery, uh, makes her pretty high for me because I feel like that is a kind of uh, mystery solving that the audience can follow. And when you can follow the logic of a detective, I tend to think of them as being a better detective and she does solve all of her mysteries to my knowledge so. well that's good that's a that's a near 100 percent success rate yeah <clears throat> well uh from what i remember that that lines up pretty well she's uh she's quite good at it she she has like some help but she's usually the one doing all the like putting things together right mm-hmm. yeah yeah she's usually the, the leader of the crew sometimes she has some uh some friends who ride along um, sometimes because this was uh, <laughs> books written for the use, there are some lads who ride along to just like drive her places, go out for soda pop. But oh, yeah. uh, usually she's, she's got some best friend characters as well who like to show up. But uh, I, I generally she is the one leading the investigation. She's the one who gets hooked onto the mystery and manages to be the one directing everyone as to where to go or actively doing the investigation herself. So she, she's definitely the main investigator of whatever book she's in. Hmm. Um, yeah. Well, that makes sense to me. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like it would be a little weird to put her in S tier, maybe. Um, mm. But she is very iconic. Like, Nancy Drew is one of those detectives you think of when you think detective. Admittedly, so is Sherlock Holmes, and we put him in A tier, so <laughs> who the fuck yeah. knows? I would, I would say Nancy Drew is a pretty easy A tier for me, at least. I would even potentially bump her up into S tier, but that is almost purely from childhood nostalgia. So. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we'll, let, let's put her in the A tier, and we might reevaluate yeah. these at the end. Um, yeah, I'm going to do a little... We'll do a little uh, there she goes. <laughs> re-racking at the end of this, see if we're, how the, we're feeling about everyone. The father of detectives himself. <laughs> I think that, it, okay, going back to the, because we pitched this earlier, the detective um, Smash Bros. style fighting game, I think mm-hmm. Nancy Drew could actually absolutely body Sherlock Holmes oh, in a fight. Yeah. I feel like Nancy <laughs> Drew is like the Princess Peach, where it's like, people mm-hmm. who don't know the game are like, oh, that's such a joke character. And then people who do know the game are like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. you, get, you get the right combo with those turnips and oh, baby. All right, here we go. <laughs> let me just add the, mm-hmm. oh, mm-hmm. God. Okay. Let me just add this trash tier tire fire real quick <laughs> oh we hit the first detective that might not be placed that highly on the list uh, yeah we're finally. talking about yeah. um, my boy humphrey bogart himself uh sam spade uh most famous for the maltese falcon although he also appeared in several short stories as well but huh. i don't think any of them are particularly well known mm. um not compared to the maltese falcon which is of course the um movie that gets held up most frequently when people talk about film noir even though it is far from my favorite film noir movie I, not, I love yeah. it but Hot not take, like it's not best. that good. <laughs> I I enjoy it a lot. I do think it is good. Is it the best film noir movie? No. And is it the best mm. mystery movie? Also no. But well, it is here, kind of fun. I'll tell you what my thought process was when watching it for the of first course. time. When it's of introduced, course. excuse me, and Sam Spade and his partner, they're like in their bright sunny office joshing together. And it's like, oh man, life is so idyllic. And then it like smash cuts to the partner getting shot. I was like, ah, this is going to kick off Sam Spade's spiral into a deep, noir, hard-boiled depression. And then Sam Spade doesn't fucking care. He's mostly just annoyed that people think he did it. 
<laughs> and then at the end, yeah. when the when the femme fatale of the movie is like, Sam, don't you love me? Why why would you turn me into the cops? He's like, well, you see, normally I wouldn't, but when a man's partner is killed, he's supposed to do something about it. And that's basically <laughs> how the movie ends. It's like, what a trash tier character. What a complete non-entity in his own story. <laughs> to be fair, that is many Humphrey Bogart characters. <laughs> I again Casablanca, I love it, and he does more in that movie to affect the plot. But there's he spends a non-zero amount of it, <laughs> moping around the bar, being like, "No, I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm not. I know that there are very dramatic events happening, and man, I just I don't want to talk about it." Look, I wouldn't uh, mind if no. he was moping, but he's not doing <laughs> shit. He's just cranky. <laughs> he's even enthused occasionally, but never about like actually mm-hmm. bad stuff. Ah, oh, whatever. Whatever. But in in terms of the detective work that Sam Spade does in the Maltese Falcon, let's let's break that down. How how we feel about his investigative method? What investigative method? <laughs> the plot <laughs> walks into his office and then keeps holding him at gunpoint. Interesting, interesting. And and would you say that that's more of a forensic or psychological approach? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I th- I think the most important thing he does in the movie is get knocked out one time. <laughs> <laughs> Which is admittedly also Tintin's signature move, but I like Tintin, so... Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. whatever. Unless I I'm think... remembering this movie really wrong, I don't think Sam Spade figures a single thing out in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's... And this is a thing that happens to a lot of noir detectives, where they sort of just get, like, carried along by the plot and things happen around them. And I, it's not, um quite as active an investigation as many of these higher tier characters so i i tend to agree with you that i think spam spade sam spam spade spam spade, sam spade is a <laughs> lower tier i don't think he's f tier because uh mm. and, and i think maybe we should talk about our lower tier rankings here because of course uh, in the himbo tier list f tier was someone who just was like not a himbo mm, problematic oh, and then oh yeah tier was not a, not a himbo right. but still an okay character uh i think here we're doing a much purer uh ranking because i don't think anyone on this list is not a detective yeah also i gotta uh i gotta point out that sam spade at one point uh knocks out peter laurie and takes his gun and and then like searches him and figures out some stuff and then when peter laurie wakes up he asks for his gun back and sam spade gives it to him and he immediately holds sam spade at gunpoint again (laughs) (laughs) and it's like is that the work of a master detective really is that the work of someone who deserves even c he's just trying to be polite (laughs) i would i would say he's probably sitting around d or e depending on how mean we want to (laughs) be i'm happy putting him in the low d's possibly Mm. let's put him on the line between d and yeah we're not we're doing another we're gonna have we're definitely gonna have to do some like uh you know some some closing up at the end of this but i think that will make for a fun time perfect all right now this one i added (laughs) Yes, this one you added. Let's let's talk about this. Let's see. Uh, let's is this a, is this a show that you watched? This is a show I have seen several episodes from. But if you ask me to tell you the ongoing plot, I could tell you its vibes, but definitely nothing that absolutely. <laughs> that is okay in the show. because the fun fact about this character, also known as Yusuke Urameshi, is that despite his title of spirit detective, he does almost <laughs> no detective work. <laughs> he oh, mostly punches people. <laughs> Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> they they can't cause murder if you punch them first. I mean, I I was almost wondering <laughs> if it was like a mistranslation, because it's like, oh, yes, your mm-hmm. title is Spirit Detective, and what do you do? Eh, basically, whatever the fuck, you know, uh, 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 Koenma tells you to do. Like, you got to go fight in this tournament? Okay, you got to go fight this pretty boy? Have fun. <laughs> but, um... Yes, he was brought up by the chat, and I was like, oh, he's so perfect because he's not a detective, but everyone insists he is. Mm. God. (laughs) Um, So the parts that you've seen, presumably the early parts? uh, Yes. Yeah, those are basically the only parts where they remember that the plot is supposed to be that he's a detective. Of course, of course. Um, And basically it's just used to plot hook him into stuff. He almost never does any actual figuring out of stuff, and usually the figuring out is, who is the bad guy? And then someone shows up and is like, yes, detective, now I'm going to kill your girlfriend. And he's like, ah, found the bad guy. <laughs> so <laughs> I think Yusuke is an absolute trash tier detective, but he is a very fun character. I'd be willing to put him below even Sam Spade, because Sam Spade at least has detective written on his door in big letters. 
Yeah, I would I would tend to agree with you on that one. I think uh, he's probably an E tier, pretty yeah. solidly. Yeah, it's what he deserves. Yeah. Get in there, he's, you crazy. He's kids. not a problematic character. No, but no, he's, he's not well, also. Uh, <laughs> well, well, he's of like, '90s anime protagonist. Yeah, he could be a lot worse. He could worse. certainly be worse. Um, so we'll put him in E tier yeah, for, for now. And we'll, I think that's probably where he's going to live for the rest of the stream. Most likely. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. I see where we are at now. And uh, let me just pop that sucker in there. This is going to be fun because yeah. I had a hot take about him in my video. Oh, yeah. This is one of the ones who got mentioned in the video. That's yeah. a fun time. Look at those tie-ins. Hey. <laughs> Reminder that if you haven't watched the detective tier list, the detective tier list <laughs> video, guys, the, de <laughs> the detective to rope talk, that hey. that is a thing that is somewhat ties into this in that Red did publish it. <laughs> I did. I sure did. <laughs> and some of these detectives are mentioned in that video. So if you want more after the stream, go watch it. Yes. Uh, so, let, let's talk about uh, uh, your boy here. Yeah. So Lord Peter Whimsey is possibly the first of these detectives who is both an actual detective and kind of action oriented. Like mm -hmm. he's not like just let's punch the problem. Like our boy Yusuke down there, but he is also not, I am a decrepit 90 year old woman and I am here to discuss this murder over tea. You know, he, he actually goes <laughs> off and does adventures and fun fact, if you read the third of the Harriet Vane books, which is the mm -hmm. one where he smooches her and it's like, okay, cool. Uh, Basically, actually, he might smooch her in the first one, too, but it's the one where it's like a fully consensual, everyone's on board with this smooching. Anyway, the point uh -huh, is, uh -huh. like, they bring up that he's going off and having, like, fun chase scenes and stuff because they use it for that one romance trope of, like, oh, you're hurt. No, it's nothing. I'm fine. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay. So all the action's happening off screen. So she could be like, not that I care, but here, take this ice pack. Hang out on my couch. I'm going to shrink some of these names while we're talking. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Oh, God. Oh, one of my favorite romantic tropes in that it's just hilarious I every time it. it shows up. And it's not supposed to be. And well, it's just... Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's like, sometimes oh, this it's is not, heartfelt, but, it but sometimes it's is. so fucking funny. <laughs> it's so funny. <clears throat> It's the best when both characters are like equally likely to get hurt in any given scenario. Yeah. Some of the when they're like battle bros, oh, yeah, it's different. It's like, you but that's not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> no, no, we're talking about Lord <laughs> Peter Whimsey. <laughs> we're getting sorry, we're talking about Lord Peter Whimsey and his mystery solving abilities. Yes. Um, Which I recall being pretty good. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a. Uh, he's also one of those types that gets often kind of over invested in the the mystery and he's mm -hmm. more of a character than a lot of these guys like he's yeah. uh he he's like a war veteran he doesn't like talking about it and he's got like basically he's got like a butler who's like ju he just looks like the stereotypical butler but he's basically the guy who deals with it when whimsy has a crazy ptsd war flashback and needs help so it's like of course so it's like oh he's so emotionally vulnerable i mean of course he was gonna get a love interest <laughs> oh all the signs were there <clears throat> but anyway, I think he's a pretty solid detective. I think he's um I'm trying to remember any mystery that he didn't figure out. Uh but I haven't read the books in a while, so I'm not like a hundo percent sure, but um Yeah, I mean I if you can't recall a notable instance where he didn't solve a mystery, it's usually a good sign that they solve most of them, if not all of their mysteries. It's my rule of thumb for detectives. And most detectives do tend to solve all their mysteries. Tintin's on thin ice because sometimes he gets knocked out and the mystery solves him, but <laughs> That's not speaking, sometimes. That happens. That, that's like how he gets from act one to act two. And that's why he's a, a low B high C, but This is why uh, he always hangs out with a dog who can like bite through his bonds whenever he gets tied up at the basement of a ship or something. Do ships have basements? I don't really know what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, they have lower decks. Right, have, like, that's probably galleys. it. Okay, where are we putting him? Uh, I would say he's somewhere in the, the B or A zone. I don't mm. think he's S tier. I don't think he's quite iconic enough to hit that S tier. I don't yeah. think he's got um quite the, the he's not he hasn't quite crystallized the cultural zeitgeist enough to put him high up. Mm. But uh, he's still a good detective, he so is, I wouldn't yeah. put him too low. Yeah, I'd say I mean, we he's a put fun him character low. to follow. I um, think he is a more solid detective than Ms. Marple. Just mm -hmm. because he does a little more actual on the ground detectiving. So I think we could put him in A tier, okay. <laughs> We're putting him in the same tier as Sherlock fucking Holmes. The comments are going to be on and fire. And Nancy Drew. <laughs> okay. And Nancy you Drew. You know what? Maybe we should put him in B tier just because I'm not sure he's on Nancy Drew's level. 
Yeah, I was gonna say, like, look, if you're not stepping to my girl Nancy, then I don't know if you can hang out on SD. Yeah, sorry. This is cool kids only. Oh, speaking of cool kids only, let's get oh. the next one up. Heck yeah, I've been waiting for this one. Yeah, speaking Chad's gonna be pleased. Definitely gone to the moon. <laughs> God, that's such a good point. Let's All right, let's talk about Batman, baby. Uh. Oh heck yeah! <laughs> Bringing Another up the number of detectives that have gone to the watching movie. various ones of their show. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So specifically the 1960s version. Let's be real. Oh yeah, yeah um, of course, of course. So yeah, Batman, yeah. Batman, uh, is not a consistent character. Some mm-hmm. writers really lean into the detective thing, and some of them forget about it entirely. So mm-hmm. this is kind of like the problem we had, like trying to classify Thor as a himbo, where it's like, well, some versions of Thor are peak himbo, some versions of Thor are not himbo at all. So like, where, where mm-hmm. exactly are we gonna cut? I mean, you know, like if we don't put Batman in the S tier, you know, there's gonna be riots. But like, should that be enough to sway our Plus. vote? In terms of how good a detective, because this tier list is not about how good a character they are, it's about how good a detective they are. Mm. And while Batman is traditionally categorized as the world's greatest detectives in DC Comics, it's one of his go-tos. Although in many runs, particularly when they get grimdark, he becomes more of just like a punchy guy. smart, punchy guy. Also, as I think to technically like a... Tim Drake is now the world's greatest detective because he's better at yeah. Batman. Yeah, well, but... that's because Tim is a delight in all senses of the word. But of course. Ba- <laughs> he's not my favorite Batman, but he's up there. But uh, <sighs> Batman... Nightwing. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I know how you're your tastes work. Look at and say that he's not the best character in the Batman. Come on. No, man. I've um, seen his butt. I know what I'm about. Yeah, it's a running gag. Like, please. Uh, <laughs> but no, Batman is in some characterizations very like that's what makes him an interesting hero is that he has to be able to solve the the mystery to to find the villain before they can finish their scheme. Whereas mm-hmm. a lot of other superheroes like. Um, Superman and Wonder Woman, they can just sort of show up and punch the thing because the worst that's going to happen is the thing has to deal with, like, some kryptonite or something. But yeah. Batman has to actually uh, compensate for not having superpowers by using his mental acuity or gadgets in some case. And the thing that he does dive into sometimes is having gadgets, but sort of knocks him down from being, I think, an S-tier detective. But mm. um, Well, Maybe. I think the thing is, again, it really depends on the version, but, like, Mm -hmm. there are some episodes of Justice League, and they are, like, the best episodes, where it's really about Batman, and he actually Mm -hmm. has to solve something. And the one I'm thinking about is Only a Dream, uh, where everyone else in the League except for Jean uh, gets uh, trapped in their dreams by uh, Dr. Destiny, and Batman has to fucking find him! He has to, like, run around and figure out where the hell he is so he can stop him. Uh while yeah. running on three nights of no sleep and it's like that is really solid like he has to do actual detective work like retrace the guy's steps <clears throat> counterpoint though in yes. the 1960s version oh. a lot of his detective work involved solving such riddles as what what sits in a tree and is very dangerous and the answer to that riddle is of course um a sparrow with a machine gun and if you <laughs> Oh, and naturally. I'm not, and I'm not saying that that's not an impressive leap of logic, but I don't necessarily know if that is an indication of quality detective work. And in the in that version, he is most certainly a detective. Pretty much every episode, he's got to he's got to put the clues together to figure out like what the villain's plan is and how to stop it. But is that <laughs> is that mm. good detective work? Questionable. With a lot fair. of it is plot armor. I also so I, I think that the variability does hurt Batman a bit in a way similar way to what it did with some of the himbos. Yeah, I agree. Also, chat uh brought up Terry, uh Batman mm. of the future, who is also a fairly good detective, but yeah. like yeah. he you know how like it's an integral part of Tintin's detective work to get knocked unconscious? It's an integral part of Terry's detective work to be wrong in the first ten minutes of the episode and sometimes get mm-hmm. beat up and then figure out what's going on. So <laughs> like let's stick with og batman for now and i think yeah i think we could put him in a tier uh i think he's hmm. oh, well it's just like <clears throat> i'd say that his detective work is highly variable but he is a remarkably mm-hmm. internally consistent character like in whichever version of the story he's in he is on top of things so like ridiculous 60s batman he's like i am in the kind of show where the answer to this riddle would be a sparrow with a machine gun 
<laughs> Justice League Batman? <laughs> All right, let's track down this crazy, like, uh, dream-hopping murderer in this creepy abandoned warehouse and fight him so he doesn't kill me. <laughs> like, you know, there's different kinds of detective work for different kinds of environments. It's kind of like how mm. they can put Sherlock Holmes in the future or make him a robot and it'll be like, he's still Sherlock Holmes. You know, he's going to do Holmesy things right. in this new setting. So I feel like Batman really does work. He doesn't have enough else going on. Like, he he sometimes punches things, but that's part of his detective method. <laughs> So yeah, I would I would say he's solidly an A or a B, and if you're leaning towards A, I think we could. We could he's iconic enough, and it, he does he is labeled the world's greatest detective. Yeah, but I feel yeah. like it would not be uncouth of us to put him that high. <laughs> I think we could justify um, sno- scooching him in here. There he goes. Uh, all right, all righty, all righty. <laughs> okay, this one's going to be fun because I have not seen the movie this one is from. Oh, fun! Well, he's from a variety of media, but well, we're talking, of course, about uh. We'll, we'll buddy, get there. I haven't buddy, put it up yet. Buddy. Well. You're gonna need to throw that out. I have no idea how to spell this man. Okay. Uh, Inspector Clouseau. I don't think I spelled it right in the Google Doc. Well, then it's gonna be wrong up here too. That. Well, that's fine. The chat can at me if they They're want. They're gonna be adding me. I've never passed a spelling test in my life, and I don't plan to now. Uh, <laughs> now, Inspector Clouseau. Uh, I don't think he's gonna be a particularly high tier detective, but I did want to put him on this list because I think he's a lot of fun, and also I think that the Pink Panther theme music is just great. But well, yes. um, you know. I think that he suffers from similar issues as the 1960s version of Batman does, where the media that he's in is inherently intended to also be comedic in addition to um, being a mystery. Mm. Uh, And in that way, his character is a bit more of a character. He's got a bit more uh, of the Poirot eccentricities, uh, but usually they're played for... I guess a lot of Poirot stuff is also played for laughs, but it's played purely for laughs as opposed to also serving the plot. Um, and he does usually solve the mystery. Of <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he is also labeled in pretty much every character description as an incompetent chief inspector. <laughs> so, all right. I, I'm, uh, I'm thinking this sounds like a C tier, maybe. Uh, yeah, I would. I would maybe even go D tier. Oh, okay. Because while he is charming and likable he's not necessarily effective at his job and job effectiveness is probably what we're list like most closely ranking at this point yeah yeah i mean really he sort it's of how stumbles good into solutions efficient. more so than actively solving them most of the time and right. the buffoonery is entertaining and charming but not a good detective does it make love me a good buffoon i'm gonna put him uh, let's do d tier also chad has pointed out we just hit three thousand viewers Oh, a lot of you for potentially being past your bedtime. And to those of you who are just getting up in the morning, howdy. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Yes. When we conceived of After Dark, we thought, oh, let's pander to the Australians. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Okay. All right. This is another one where I haven't seen the show they're from, but uh, chat has been saying this guy constantly. So Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. is going to be. I think this is going to be good. So. This is another show that I watched in middle school and loved. Uh, we're talking about Sean Spencer from Psy. Yeah, woo! <laughs> now, is. he's he's an interesting one, because the premise of the show is that he is a um, con man pseudo-psychic. So he's going around as a, as a part-time consultant for uh, the police department, um, helping solve cases by pretending to be a psychic. And what he's actually doing is a very Sherlock Holmesian type of trying, or maybe not Sherlock Holmesian so much as it is Miss Marpleian. Well, <laughs> That's harder to say. As I understand it, it's uh, like Sherlock Holmes amped up to 11, right? Like yeah, he, he yeah, like notices the of, tiniest um, details. He, he puts everything together mm-hmm. so fast that the reason why he has to pretend to be psychic is because the cops were like, you got to stop calling in these anonymous tips and solving these crimes. We think you did those crimes. And he's like, no, no, I, uh, and he's like, hmm, what's an easier sell? I'm really, really smart, and you're all idiots, or I'm psychic. <laughs> and, yeah, that's uh, basically it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was reading up on this show. I haven't watched it, but I think it would be exactly my kind of thing. So It is uh, delightful, and I enjoy it quite a bit. I highly recommend it. But um, I think he's a, a, honestly a pretty high-ranking detective for me, because similar to uh, Sherlock Holmes, you know, he has a very um, logical way of solving the mystery, uh, and they do a very good job of the show of sort of following his line of sight and where he's looking around places to sort of identify um, what he's keying into. So even though he's supposed to be this incredibly smart character who solves things really quickly, 
they never seem to uh, leave the audience behind when they're solving those mysteries so quickly. Hmm. And he's a, it's a lot of fun to watch him work because he's doing this double duty of solving the mystery and pretending to be a psychic. And there's always character drama with trying to keep that lie up. Um, uh, he also sort of has like a almost uh, like a Watson-y character and his best friend who's like the straight man of the show uh, who sort of walks around trying to just help him keep that uh, persona up. I personally think that he's probably an easy... B tier, maybe. I don't know if he's quite iconic enough to hit that A tier. Uh, Although I do really like his methodology, but solidly a B. He is, I mean, from what I've seen of it, it seems like he's got a near 100% success rate, which is pretty solid. Yeah, pretty Um, much. (laughs) I would feel a little weird putting him in the same category as Sherlock Holmes and Batman, but I'm okay putting him one notch below. He's definitely inspired by, like, he's one of those characters where it's like, oh, you're not exactly a Sherlock Holmes clone, but you're definitely inspired by him. And then someone was like, well, if I'm going to write Sherlock Holmes fan fiction, I'm going to put this one twist on the character and set it in the modern day. Ah, All right, I'm Uh, putting him in B tier. He's more personable than Sherlock Holmes, too, because he's a con man. So at the end of the day, you know, he's got to be so He's he's got to be charismatic. He's got to roll high on those charisma checks. All right. Um, So he's fun to watch work. But yeah, I think B tier is a solid place to stick him. And the next one is going to be... This one. Fun. Yes. Oh, I'm that, happy that we're doing this one. This has also been re- reje- uh, rejected. Re- I <laughs> lost the ability to speak about three hours ago. Oh no. L I double R, and I have just been trying to get it back ever since. <laughs> but we're doing it anyway. Uh, this is also requested by the chat quite a bit. Uh, we are talking, of course, about the Scooby Gang. The Scooby Gang. I saw a few requests for Velma alone, but like, guys, come on, we got to bring the whole gang in. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Here's the thing, I think, with the Scooby Gang, and it's interesting because people were, ref- were requesting Velma alone, uh, and I think you could make an argument for Velma, Fred, and potentially Daphne as to being detectives in their own right, because mm. I-, I love Shaggy and Scooby fill an important role in rounding out the five-man band, but they don't do a lot of active solving of the mysteries, yeah. but I think that, it, that the gang together has to be considered as a group, because they don't solve mysteries alone pretty much ever. <laughs> I agree, yeah. I my instinct is to put them as high as Nancy Drew in terms of iconic, mystery solving, shockingly effective at what they do. Um, I mean, there's really just no beating it, right? It's like, oh, you've got your classic five man band, and uh, mm-hmm. well, you know, uh, you know what? Let's not go too far into that. Uh, <laughs> that way, madness lies. You've got your classic <laughs> yes. ensemble cast of colorful heroes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they solve mysteries. R- literally, what else do you need? We just I would also out. rank them pretty high. And I think a part of the reason for me that I would rank them up there is because they are a, a gang. They are a, a ensemble. And they make up for each other's weaknesses. So while, like, if someone asked me to put Shaggy and Scooby, say, on a list, um, they fall backwards into clues and, like kind of wing their way into solutions in a very Tintin sort of way. I, again, I haven't seen Tintin, but it's based on the two five minutes of talking about him. Uh, but they're compensated for by Velma, who does more of the uh, logical forensic solving, as much as, you know, the Scooby-Doo cartoons ever get to forensics. <laughs> the, the, they compensate for each other's weaknesses in a way that I think p- p- tied in with their iconicness does make them a pretty uh, pretty high-ranking group. I would be, I would be yeah. comfortable with an A-tier. Yeah. And they do solve, as far as I'm aware, all of their mysteries. No, I agree. Um, I feel like the problem is the Scooby Gang is such a solid mystery-solving gang that, like, mm-hmm. when the show, wh- whenever the story is going off the rails, they're always like, what if this time there is no mystery? What if this time it really is a ghost? And it's like, just stop, guys. <laughs> what do you think Come these on. guys do? They drive yeah, a just band go called right the Mystery the Machine. The files. Yeah. Let Scooby Doo be Scooby Doo. Exactly. Uh, also, the live action Scooby Doo movies, they still slap. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, they do. If you're looking for movie wrecks, they should. <laughs> they give you a few of them. Oh, you get the feeling they were written movie. by someone who didn't really like Fred that much, but other than that. <laughs> are you, are you Freddie Prince Jr.? Uh, first of all, Abs- that's one of my favorite Fred characters. No, I love that version of Fred. Fred. Someone who likes Fred a lot. Well, but, like, you, you gotta admit, that's not really the Fred from the shows. And in the first movie, he's kind of a dick for a while. Like, come on. like Yeah, but he's also under that weird, uh... He's <laughs> under the evil spell. No, he's only under the evil spell later. <laughs> he's just being mm. a regular dick at the beginning. 
was not Kevin is not a dick by the end. That's character development. This is this. We already talked about Fred on the himbo tier list. We I, cannot I, spend this. Much you're time. telling me our sweet beefy boy would have been an actual jerk to the rest of the Scooby Gang? No, that's not the real Fred. Everyone else is fine. I think the problem is the person who made that movie was like, "Look, Daphne and Velma is the only ship in this show that makes sense." That's true. and they that's were right, true. but they made Fred kind yeah, of a dick as they a were result. Today. Absolutely yeah. correct. Um, Let's just put them in the A tier and call it a day. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There they go. <laughs> right up next the to Batman. The <laughs> hole has been opened. Oh boy, here we go. This is a this is gonna be an interesting one. <clears throat> da, 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 da. Yeah, let's talk about him. Pop this sucker in there. Boop. This one was another one who was uh, brought up in the detective trope talk. Yeah. It has been a while since I read any of his comics, uh, but Dick Tracy was a pretty iconic, uh, like, s- newspaper comic uh, mm-hmm. detective for just ages. Oh, sorry. Ages and ages. Um, <laughs> and uh, as I recall, he was a fairly standard hard-boiled detective with a couple weirdnesses, one of them being he used a lot of gadgets. Uh, mm. And I think this is one of those, like, stuff you can get in a cereal box things where it's like oh boy, yes a there was wrist a addendum to his comic that started in 1949 called the crime stoppers textbook where yep. they added like illustrated guides for the amateur crime fighter wow. <laughs> there was a lot of like hmm, write in for your decoder ring Incredible. which uh unfortunately i was born after the era of writing in for decoder rings because i absolutely <laughs> would have had one on every finger you know it uh, nothing's shame. getting no codes in this house uh. <laughs> Hate to miss the 50s, but, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, no, uh, Dick Tracy's pretty solid. However, a lot of the people he's dealing with aren't exactly, like, subtle. I mm-hmm. recall he was stuck in a giant birdcage at least once. So, like, these are not, like, super sneaky masters of crime, you know? He's, like, mm-hmm. he's just mm-hmm. kind of dealing with a bunch of weirdos. So... <clears throat> That like... is also true of some of the other names on this list, however. That like is Batman, true. you could make the same Batman argument for Scooby Gang yeah. also definitely been caught in a birdcage. No, that's true, that's true. Um Yeah, I just I don't know. I my instincts are telling me not to put him like super high, but I'm trying to think of why exactly. Like he didn't really do anything wrong. I I think it's just that he's not super exemplary. He's like really mm-hmm. middle of the road. He feels like a trope um and he is yeah. you know he, he's like he's like they took the hard-boiled noir detective and then they toned it down so that it was okay for kids so he's not an alcoholic but he has everything about the attitude <laughs> and the jaw that you can <laughs> cut glass with oh 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 <clears throat> yeah uh no i i kind of agree with you like he's he's certainly a good detective um but he's not an outstanding one and so i think he's maybe like a b or a c tier poll mm. um yeah. I don't know if I would put him so low as C because he is sort of iconic for the genre. He's, he's, you know, Dick Tracy is synonymous with the hard-boiled detective, but he's not the only one synonymous with the hard-boiled detective either. So it, it's yeah. sort of a weird space to be operating in. Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like we could easily put him in C tier and that, you know, he's... It's a passing grade, but it's not, like, mm-hmm. setting the curve. Like, D- Dick Tracy didn't yeah. invent any of the tropes we're playing with. Almost everyone else here has been either a purposeful joke character like Clouseau or very much kind of carving their own path or Sam Spade, but he's low mm-hmm. for a reason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Red has personal beef with that it's one. Just, I expected more of from that movie. Everyone was like, it's a classic. And then it was not fun. Whatever. Okay. Anyway, I think we can put him in C and call it. Yeah, I think that's the same. Well, let's add someone officially to the C tier. Other than again, I don't know why you keep bragging on Tintin. I think it's just because his name is easy to say. What? <laughs> I, I mean, come on, man. Tintin's fine. Yeah. If you if you don't read any of the comics that look like they have a not white person in it, you won't have a bad time. Mm, what a ringing endorsement! <laughs> it was like the forties, possibly <laughs> earlier. Oh, right. Well, let's throw Dick Tracy in the C tier. Yeah, um, he's in there. All yeah, right. That's, Let me that just feels right. load up the next guy. Uh, mm-hmm. I think chat will be this pleased. A, yes, yes. Speak. Well, we've heard, we've seen a few requests for the Ace Attorney series popping up in chat, and this is the one who actually holds the title of detective in the series, and I want to just take, take a moment to talk about that. Yep. Because, of course, throughout Ace Attorney, you are playing lawyers who go and do trials, and typically through the course of the trial, because that is the main thrust of the game, you solve a mystery. But there is actually one character in the series who is an actual detective. 
Uh, and that is, of course, my man, Detective Dick Gumshoe. Yep. Incredible naming convention right out the gate. We gotta love it. Does yep. he wear rock a trench coat? Yes, you he does. You better believe it. <laughs> you better believe it. Uh, is he a good detective? I would say no. no, because you, as the defense attorney, have to do all the work that the detective is traditionally expected yes, to do. He's frequently called as a character witness and then proven to be, if not intentionally lying, obs- obscuring the truth in some way or having missed in a very obvious detect- deduction. Mm. Look, I I love him. He's one of my favorite Ace Attorney characters, but he is a... In game, he is defined as a bad detective, <laughs> and I cannot, in good conscience, put him above the D tier. If like, he's he is explicitly a bad detective. That's fair. I will say every first case is him messing up something along the process of, like either uh, processing the scene or <laughs> or questioning a witness, and then you have to correct him in trial. Truly, I, you know. <laughs> I would say. Yeah, I think he goes above Yusuke just because he actually seems to remember that being a detective is his job. <laughs> yes, he, he knows that he is a detective and he tries to do detective things. He yeah. just does them poorly, which is sort of the Inspector Clouseau kind of caveat. He's a, he's a joke character, you know? All right, so D tier, it sounds like? It sounds like D tier, yeah. There Again, I goes. love him. He's one of my favorite characters. Yes, our sweet he's funky just... boy. Sweet Pokey Boy. He was on the Himbo tier list too. We know yeah, this. Yeah. Think of it as like yeah. the mirror of that. Like Yes, exactly. One can be an excellent Himbo and a terrible detective. In fact, that is the most common way for that particular <laughs> pairing to play out. All right, let me let me add the next one. This one's gonna be fun because I genuinely don't know if anyone's gonna remember this was what that guy's name was. Um Well, we could do our best impressions of his accent and see if that immediately cute clues. As if <laughs> Yeah. All right, here we go. Benoit Blanc. Uh, A.K.A. Daniel Craig's character in Knives Out. Yeah, yeah, the detective from Knives Out. Uh, a movie that a lot of people brought up in the comments, but I didn't put I in the video. It. Um, I love it so much. It's really good. It's. It got so snubbed at the Oscars. I was oh, so mad about that. Yeah. Don't even get me... Oh, oh, oh my God, that movie's so good. What's great like, about it the... is it, it starts as a whodunit, and then it pivots to a how get away with it, and then it t- switches back to being a whodunit. And it's like, what? Okay. It's incredible. It's one of, you know, we see a lot of movies that are homages to different genres nowadays, and then this is one of the ones where I was like, this is a perfect homage to, like, the Agatha Christie murder mystery genre. Yep, like, this yep. is exactly what I want from, like, a modern retelling of that kind of a story. It's got a very, speaking of, the, the you know, what it does well, it's got a very charismatic detective who's a little bit kooky to those around him, because yep. he's certainly got an interesting accent that I, an American, have no idea how to place. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm so glad that Daniel Craig got to flex whatever that was. <laughs> you have a but good he, he's heart. also a, a, an effective solver of mysteries. Yeah, um, he is. And what I like about him is that uh, if you watch carefully, or you've already watched like the Cinema Wins video about it, um, he figures out who did it the minute he meets her. Mm-hmm. But he keeps investigating. Critically, he doesn't jump to the easy conclusion mm-hmm, he, he's mm-hmm. trying to figure out the why and the how and the what's going on and then he puts it all together and actually does the big poirot reveal in the room full of suspects which is fantastic uh, yes that that movie is just really good and again like we're, we're trying to judge these detectives kind of separate from the quality of the universe they're in so like if they're from a like fundamentally iffy like written universe it's like yeah but how well are they navigating it this is a really Mm -hmm. good movie and i'm trying not to let that color my judgment of how good a (laughs) detective he is um but he does consistently notice a lot of cool stuff and for a lot of the movie we are following the perspective of the uh person trying to get away with it ish uh mm-hmm. and basically there's a lot of times where she notices a clue and she quickly covers it up before he notices but it's left kind of ambiguous whether or not he did mm-hmm. or did not mm-hmm. notice it's, it's implied that like just because he can't find the clue there because it's been obscured or like etc cetera, etc cetera, doesn't mean he doesn't know that it was there so yeah i think he's really solid i, I think he's a very good detective yeah. and and uh, I like how he doesn't just solve the mystery. He solves the mystery behind the mystery. 
Exactly. He doesn't stop at the obvious solution, which is a sign of a bad detective. He, right. he looks for the backup. He looks for what's going on behind the scenes. And he does it with a lot of style and flair. And again, another character who can absolutely rock a trench coat, which is on my personal <laughs> my personal uh, category of detectives. I don't think I put him in S tier because I don't think he's... He's only been in one movie. And I don't think mm-hmm. he's quite iconic enough to hit that S tier. But I would not hesitate to put him in A or B. Oh, agree. Uh, I would yeah. even maybe lean more towards A. Because I, I, I do definitely. think even like with... Yeah. Even within the context of the movie he's in... Um, the way he navigates the story is uh, skilled, but um, I lost my train of thought. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, <laughs> this happens sometimes, audience. Yeah. Uh, he, he's skilled at putting together the mystery, but he doesn't let it uh, obscure his vision in the way that is very easy to do if you're on a particularly one-track yeah. uh, solution to the, the story. Uh, and it, le- it lets the story breathe, but it also solves the problem, which is what we're looking for in a detective here. You're solving the mystery, you're solving the problem, and I think that makes him an easy A tier. And again, well, he rocks the trench coat. Yeah, what I, what I yes, uh, what I love about the theming of Knives Out specifically is that mm-hmm. the one thing is it is very, very important to be kind. Uh, yes. And in the words of the detective himself, it was your kind heart. Uh, <laughs> And that's uh, that's Commit really it. the Commit most the important accent. thing. That, that's the most important thing. It was it was his kind heart and like noticing the blood and being like, let's hear what she has to say, and then going from there. Mm-hmm. It was her kind heart in helping out this old man whose family were all kind of trying to kiss up to him without actually caring, um, and of course them all kind of turning on everyone the minute it looks like their livelihood is threatened where it's mm-hmm. like they're, they're not being kind they're being nice there's a difference i don't know that's a really good movie everybody should watch it and then watch it again yes. so you pick up on all the stuff you missed the first time yes it's right. so good uh definitely an easy idea oh okay um, this, one, uh, <laughs> this, next one, this one shouldn't take me too long let me just uh pop mm. that sucker in there and uh, yeah, this one's for all the anime fans in the chat. Nope. <laughs> Amazingly, I still managed to typo it. Uh, how am I going to move this? How am I going to... It's so tiny, I can't select it. I'm just going to slowly creep it across the screen with my <laughs> with my arrow keys. Uh, we're talking about L. <laughs> we're talking about L from Death Note. Yeah, there he goes. Uh... Slowly. <laughs> Is L a good detective? Because he is L explicitly a, a detective in in the uh, the manga, the anime. Yes. He is trying to unravel the mystery of who Kira is, uh-huh. um, and he does very quickly encounter Light Yagami. <laughs> God damn it! He does quickly <laughs> encounter Light Yagami, and he he does quickly suspect that he is Kira. Yes, but he then spends a lot of time trying to prove that thesis. What I actually quite like about that is that. Um, L is really, really smart, and Kira thinks he's really, really smart. Mm-hmm. So basically, Kira will spend will spend an entire episode, sometimes two episodes, in Kira's head as he's like, "Oh, if L finds out about this thing, he'll know I'm Kira for sure. I gotta cover it up by killing this lady or whatever." And then, like, it'll cut to L being like, hmm, by the mysterious death of this lady, we can conclude that your son is almost certainly Kira. <laughs> it's just really <laughs> fucking funny to me that Kira does everything in his power to keep L from finding shit out. And it takes L like, five episodes tops to, like, zero in on him. Um, mm-hmm. Which is really, mm-hmm. I think, a good sign because it's like, it kind of highlights that the whole point is that Kira's really not that good at this. He just has a power that nobody on the planet could guess. <laughs> Um, and even then, L gets there pretty quick. So, uh... Yeah. And of course, because we're following the antagonist's perspective, we almost always have the information that L is working off of. It's just a question of how mm-hmm. does L find it out. Um, so this does mean that the writer can cheat sometimes. It's like, because the audience already knows that, uh, Light is Kira, you know, we can kind of be like, oh, if we let L figure this out, we don't really need to explain too much of it. We can just be like, oh, I put it from, together from this and this, and the audience will be like, oh, yeah, I mean, it's true, so sure. Um, and one thing I think is interesting is that the only time where L seems genuinely thrown is when Kira does the one thing, getting rid of his own memories. Because from that point mm, forward, L yes. has no way to prove that... Basically, at that point, all they can get is that Light was Kira. And even then, mm-hmm. L figures out that Light did something and is now Kira again. 
But at that point, he's like, well, guess I'll die. And then he just does. So it's like, okay, cool. Um, and what I like about that is that it's it's just such good writing. And then the problem is the show goes on for another, like, ten episodes. <laughs> And it yeah, have that's to. the thing. I it does. I mean, I and I'm trying to I'm trying to think if this is separate from the show or if this is a problem with Elle, because it does. I think he suffers a little bit from tunnel vision, but I mm. think that that tunnel vision into, you know, he, he does very quickly put together who Kira is, and then he's attempting to prove it. That's yep. the thrust of the show. And because that is so central to the pl- the plot of the show, I think that that excuses some of the exclusion of investigating other possible avenues. Again, yeah, no, it's, just, I agree. it's a tricky space to differentiate that because so much of <laughs> fucking Death Note, uh, <laughs> I think, does sort of break the typical mystery mold. It does, but... yeah, because we follow the antagonist. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. that I think L has to be doing something right because after he's mm-hmm. dead, they bring in two more L's, and neither of them are any good. So like. <laughs> L must have been hitting some kind of magical balance that the others didn't hit. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I think he's he's pretty high up there yeah. uh, in terms of investigative ability. I don't know if I would put him as high as like I don't think he's S tier. I think the problem is here's the thing: L is a solid detective. I think he is more solidly just written as a very intelligent character. So, like, mm-hmm. he, he's not single-mindedly devoted to the investigation. It's a battle of wits. So, like, yes. even the very first time when he does the the announcement on TV, you know, they say it's worldwide, but actually they're only broadcasting in this one part of Japan because that means that if they get, you know, Kira activity, that means he must be in that part of Japan. And it's like, that's a very mm-hmm. smart move. That's not a very detective-y move, but it, it does no. make sense. Like, the detective is usually pretty guileless when it comes to, like, actually doing the figuring out stuff. But L is being sneaky from minute one, which I think actually makes him an extremely effective detective, just not a standard one. I would be willing to put him in A tier in terms of being, like, quite solid at his job and also kind of genre-defining, but, like, in a way that's pretty hard to mm-hmm. imitate. Um, admittedly, I haven't yeah, read the manga. I'm... I don't know if he's way worse, but, yeah. <laughs> no, I'd be, I'd be willing to put him up there as well. I think, I think because, uh, you know, if we have to separate the detective from the yeah. story as much as possible although you know detectives are built by their stories but yeah. i i think putting him up in a tier even though he does uh investigate one person specifically because again the perspective that we're watching it from is the one person being investigated right. so we can't fully separate that i i think a tier is a fair placement it does have and the that problem... also fits with the other characters that we... yeah well it does have the problem that l is also correct because the writer needs him to be correct like they do a pretty good job of justifying in story like no he actually did figure this out or like this is weird enough or like he doesn't tend to jump to the conclusion he'll usually he'll he'll, like always be playing some game like he'll say i'm about this percent sure but it's actually way higher and and you know he he waits and sees he doesn't really jump straight to we have to take action he's kira let's do it right now you know Mm -hmm. um so i i don't know i think they do a good job enough of avoiding the whole like magical genius it was a boomerang thing so i i think we're okay but the problem is like the difference between a character who is right because they figured it out and a character who's right because the writer needs them to be is very minor but it's the difference between being top tier and bottom tier detective quality wise yes so, yeah i'm just gonna exactly. very slowly start nudging him left <laughs> <laughs> into the a column. and so begins his journey over into the a column <laughs> Traveling over the vast savannas of the top of our chair in the library room, past the plushies and the fireplace and Cleo, over and uh, the stream is delayed, so I know that you're moving it, but it's <laughs> very slow. We're about mind. halfway there. And over and over and over it goes into oh, the painful. locations in which L will be placed eventually. We're lucky and we're not so moving him much. You follow up right now. the circle of life continuing. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> This is very David Attenborough-y. Yeah, I, I don't know how to do a David Attenborough impression. Should I do the Watch Mojo one? Oh, God. Welcome to no! Watch Mojo. No! We're watching as Elle moves slowly over to the A column. And, of course, as we do this, we're going to be going through and ranking other detectives afterwards. But we have to very slowly move the text He's first. In. We're good. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> oh, he's in? Okay, good. Okay. I wasn't on at that time. Next one. Uh, and just uh, before we move on to the next one, I feel like just to throw a reminder out there, we are we're fundraising for yes. uh, a variety of good fa- causes, mainly focused on uh, Hurricane Eda relief to help all of those affected 
by that particular natural disaster. But if you if you have any spare change, if you're enjoying the, the content we're putting out here for you today, uh, and you have the ability, consider donating to to help us uh, provide some relief to those those who need it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Here we go. Next up, John Constantine. Fuck, I'm Woo! gonna need to remove L because he's a little awkwardly played. Uh, maybe I can hold on. Maybe I can. No, that's all of them. <laughs> kind of... What's happening? <laughs> I kind of like that L, I and mean, obviously I haven't caught up to whatever just happened, but I kind of like that L is just sort of like very large. In the <laughs> I'm going to nudge him next to, no, wait, what's happening? Ah! All right, I, I think I figured out the problem. I put it in a folder and I shouldn't have put it in a folder. There we go. Mm, nice, nice, All nice. Right, Classic gonna... folder organization. Listen, kids, if you do one thing in the digital space, organize your folders. Name them something clear, have a system, and refresh it constantly. That is... That that is your tip from Indigo today. Okay, he's in. Let's talk about John Constantine. Let's talk about John Constantine. This is uh, the the second DC Comics character we're talking about. It is. About yeah. What's funny is that uh, when they did uh, Justice League Dark, they were like, "Oh, you thought Batman was the darkest member of the Justice League? We're gonna make him the lightest member of this new gang he's hanging out with." <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Um. Another character who can rock a trench coat. I uh, had to note that at the top because that is, of course, one of my qualifications for good detective. And he is designed to look exactly like Sting, so you know it's mm-hmm. good. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, John Constantine, for those of you who may not know... Oh, wow, $200 donated. Nice. Thank you, oh, thank Anonymous. You. Um, but yeah, uh, John Constantine is a DC <laughs> Comics the mystery character. If we put the clues together, surely we could figure it out. Oh, yeah, that's how it works. Uh, John Constantine yeah. from DC Comics. Basically, mm-hmm. he's... Okay, you all know Harry Dresden, right? He's basically that, yeah. but earlier and blonde. Um, mm-hmm. He's a he's a magical detective. Uh, he solves wizard crimes. <laughs> no, he, he solves, My favorite like, of all crimes. He solves uh, like, paranormal you know. shit. Uh, he investigates yeah, when uh, stuff's going wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Less official X Files investigation. And I guess he dated King Shark, but that's not really here nor there on his detective qualifications. I don't know. I think Yeah, I think that bumps him up a tier or two. Yeah. <laughs> um Yeah, so I think John Constantine is quite a solid detective with one caveat, which is he has a lot of baggage. Just so much angst. Yes. Like it is oh man, mm-hmm. so many dead friends. So many like tortured backstory things. Uh, I believe at one he point he has a section on his fan ba- fan fan uh, hmm, fandom like wiki page that's just labeled shady past, and then the second section is great darkness. <laughs> uh, so... That's a good sign. <laughs> mm-hmm. Various mm-hmm. crimes. Um, yeah, basically he. Um, I believe his coolest act is uh, at one point he gets various lords of hell to cure his terminal lung cancer by i think selling his soul to all of them so that if they try (laughs) and collect it'll start a war in hell that they can't afford so they just cure his cancer instead so he's not gonna die anytime soon which is a great smart guy moment not Mm -hmm. super detective-y of him um i guess the problem is john constantine is a detective in the same way that like yusuke is you know it's like it, mm-hmm. that's a plot hook that gets him into the story but then he doesn't tend to do all that much detective work it's mostly like magic right dealing with mostly occasionally. magic punch him ups maybe just do like a seeking spell or something i think you know i think it's good to compare him to boston to boston, to boston. <laughs> i've lost the ability to speak completely over the course of this stream Hell i think yeah. it's a good uh point to compare him to is batman because we of course he's one of our highly ranked detectives of course uh in terms of how they operate to, to really highlight why i think john constantine is not that high tier of a detective and mm. it's where batman is actually taking a lot of steps to do investigative work to to reach the conclusion of not necessarily a mystery to figure out the scheme that his villains are up to john constantine is doing a lot more of a if I use my magic to show up in hell, maybe I can punch my way to a solution or well, spell my way to a solution. I, I'm not necessarily as much as you skate. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, John Constantine is not so punchy, but he does get mm-hmm. punched a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd say he's a very solid character, but that uh, does that make him a very solid detective? And I think the answer is no. Yeah, I, I think the answer is no. I'd say he's higher up than Dick Tracy, but maybe not that much higher. 
I would maybe put him in the C tier because he is okay. a detective and he does solve mysteries. But he does it with a lot of baggage. He, yeah, it's like most is the story about the mystery or is it about John Constantine being sad again? And it's mm. usually about John being sad. Por que no los dos? Yeah. All right. Okay, let's see. Ah, right. Ooh, okay, this yeah. is just going to be fun. Uh, I'll, I'll do the this short a, I'm version. I'm so excited for this. Yeah, I know you yes. are. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of shows I watch and like. Just a sec. Here we go. All right. Much like the Scooby Gang, this mm-hmm. one is another collective. Um, so, Criminal Minds. I love Criminal Minds. So, for those in the audience who don't know, um, I love procedurals. I regularly watch entire runs of procedurals in the course of a week. I recently watched 11 seasons of NCIS, which I don't recommend doing because it's actually not that good. Uh, all of Longmire, all of that. I've watched all the X-Files, Lucifer, season six just dropped. I got to go watch that after this stream. But The Criminal Minds is, I think, one of, it's the gold standard for the modern procedural. And I'm glad that we're talking about it on this tier list because when we were making the list, I thought about how many different procedural teams could we throw on here. And I realized I don't actually know how much they count as detectives mm. because they do sort of do the thing where they spread the detectiving around the group. And so, Red, I'm interested to hear how you would, because you, of course, recently did a video on detectives. And if you mm-hmm. haven't, uh, if you're watching <laughs> this stream and you have not yet seen that video, make a ded- dedicated viewing afterwards, um, how you would quantify like a procedural team would you say that there is one character that fulfills the detective role or do they sort of all contribute to that yeah i'd say that um much like a five-man band collectively produces a skill set that's greater than the sum of its parts with fewer of the weaknesses but can still kind of be treated as a single unit um i would say that something like the bau an organization dedicated to collectively working together to solve mysteries is Mm -hmm. basically just that again it's like each individual character is not qualified enough to be a proper detective some of them are for breaking down doors some of them are for using computers Mm -hmm. (laughs) some Mm -hmm. of them are for being really stoic you know how this is um some of them are for being being played by matthew gray (laughs) goobler or mandy patinkin the main fucking guy in the first few seasons is fucking Inigo Montoya and nobody told yeah. me. Yeah. So that's a thing, which did kind of ruin the viewing experience because every time he was in yeah. peril, I was like, dude, just sword fight them. What are you doing? Quit fucking around. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Anyway, yeah. So I think that uh, analyzing the, the BAU collectively by their mystery solving mm-hmm. capacity is pretty solid. Uh, I will say yeah. that uh, I... I didn't watch very much Criminal Minds, about a season and a half. Um, mm-hmm. And it was not a formula. You didn't formula. do the full run all at once. <laughs> I did not, actually. Uh, but I did. But it's not a formula I was used to. I, I'd never really seen no. a... Uh, I just don't tend to watch procedurals. Mostly when I watch like a detective thing or read a book, the killer has been introduced when they figure out they're the killer. Like, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, it was the maid? No way. Whereas in a police procedural, especially one dedicated to psychological profiling... They basically construct the profile of the killer, and then we see the killer for the first time, and then Mm -hmm, they have to find mm -hmm. the killer. And the the main tension is the dramatic irony where the audience gets to see what the killer is up to before they find them. Um, Right. It's sort of, it's interesting, because Columbo does something similar, where in the beginning of every episode, you see the crime committed, you know who the killer is, and it plays on that dramatic irony. But uh, the way that procedurals usually unravel is the dramatic irony builds over the course of the episode and you, you're rooting for them mm-hmm. to reach the same conclusion that you, the audience, have been shown is where they need to end up. Uh, and Criminal Minds does it in an interesting way because, of course, they focus on... Uh... What is the word I am looking for? Um, profiling. <laughs> profiling, yes. <laughs> profiling, yes. The, the, their profilers to the FBI. Um and so their their methodology in solving crimes tends to be very uh, based in psychology, but supported with uh, research and evidence that they're pulling from scenes and from patterns. It's, there's a lot of pattern recognition in that show. Patterns. A lot of patterns. A lot of lot of maps up on boards with big red circles on. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh man, I live for that shit. Uh, and I I do think that it, it because it has a slightly different format. It is tough to tell how 
good detectives any given procedural team is because unlike a lot of characters who are out there solving a mystery where all of the players are on the board or where it's about putting the clues together um you know certainly they are doing elements of that uh but because of the given the format of the procedural versus the mystery um they, they don't necessarily i would say um fulfill that same niche that a detective typically does it's similar but it is not exactly uh the same but again we've been trying to avoid judging these detectives based on their media that they're in although i think it is hard to separate the bau from the procedural genre since it's compared to the other detectives on the list they're the ones that are right the most different yeah i think um the bau is kind of tricky because from a certain point of view they don't really solve crimes it's more Mm -hmm. like they figure out who did this last set of crimes so that they can stop them before they do another crime yes and it's like mystery solving is incorporated in that but like yeah it's not about unraveling the threads of a delicately woven tapestry of crime and uh motivation it's more like okay someone has blown up a thing we gotta go figure out who that is so they don't blow up another thing i mean it might just be Um, from the first season but most of the time it's someone has been murdering women in this neighborhood our suspect is almost certainly a man between the ages of 20 and 50 probably white and smartly dressed and it's like every episode they say the same profile God, and then there's the season where their main enemy is this guy named Mr. Scratch, and don't even. So, mm. look, if you're gonna watch Criminal Minds, just watch all the seasons that are on Netflix, and then just stop. Like, it's not worth it after that. Um, Fantastic. Because in the yeah, uh, that's it, the, my recommendation of the day. But uh, I don't think they're necessarily a good detective, hmm. so I would hesitate to put them high on the list. Even though I love the BAU, I love Criminal Minds. I just don't necessarily know if they fulfill the the, the ticks the boxes that we're looking for in detectives here. Well. We could probably put him in C tier with, you know, technically does detective work, but it's kind of overshadowed by the other stuff. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a fair yeah. place for them. Scooch this bad boy in there. Heck yeah. Bam, baby. Swoop. Okay, let's see. Uh, all right, perfect. Chat's going to be pleased. <clears throat> <laughs> Heck yeah. Let's do another one. Speaking of procedurals, but that are also sort of workplace comedy. <laughs> there he is. Uh, the boy himself. Jake, Jake Peralta, Peralta from Brooklyn, from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Nine-Nine. Yeah, baby. Nine-Nine, baby. Nine-Nine. All right. Definitely a detective. Because Definitely. Because that is his title on the show. Yes. Um, I, I, wanna, I feel like we should touch on this because there are other, other detectives in the show. Um, why did we just pull Jake? <laughs> For this list. Yeah. Uh, and it's because he's typically the POV character. Not always because it's an ensemble cast. But if we're going to be doing detective work, it's usually Jake who's going to be the one doing it. Mm. Um, that's sort of a big part of his character. Uh, and also he's the ostensibly main character of the show. So yes. I feel like and that's a fair enough statement. Canonically, he is the best at solving mysteries. They had a whole contest about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think Jake is a very solid detective. I think, um... yeah, let's see. Uh... The thing is, it is a police procedural, and yes. I feel like we would be remiss in bringing it up without mentioning that they've recently kind of pivoted slightly in the latest season to sort of address how much more controversial <laughs> cops became in the last couple of years. Yes. Um, uh... And, I, you know, huge props <laughs> to them for addressing that, frankly. But, like, mm-hmm. what this means mm-hmm. is that a lot of the things that make Jake a good, like good mystery solver in the earlier seasons have aged really weirdly like when yes, jake there's... follows a hunch and then it looks like he got it wrong and he's like no way i followed my hunch and it was wrong but then at the end it always turns out that actually he was right mm-hmm. and it's like yeah but like you definitely didn't do the right thing when you grabbed that guy when he hadn't actually done anything wrong that you knew about like yeah there's the fact that you were you right bring someone in they've got 48 hours to pin the crime on him and i'm oh, like uh, but if you're wrong that's <laughs> not good there's like two episodes uh, like that uh yeah there, there's also the one where he arrests the guy right out of jail because the guy called him joke peralta and it, i think that, that might be the, the same one yeah and it's just like um... yeah and yeah. that's uh, obviously h4 leave it was it was bad at the time and it's not great now but yeah, it's more uh, visibly in terms bad. of like 
in terms of his actual detective work, because there are a lot of episodes where he does put clues together to solve a crime, uh, the, the thing that I think it makes it hard to judge how good of a de- detective Jake is is because a lot of times the thrust of any given episode that he's in, it's not necessarily about the crime that they're solving because mm-hmm. it, while it's it, while it is a, a police precinct-based show, I don't know if I would actually call it a procedural. I think it's more of a workplace comedy. Yeah, I agree. Because uh, there are lots of episodes where there isn't even a crime happening. They're just doing cop things. Yeah, they're um, just messing around. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but Yeah, but in the episodes where he does have to solve crimes, he it does tend to be that there will be a collection of clues usually got some sort of board up on the wall jake will be looking around at it trying to figure it out trying to put together what's happening and he does usually have reach a somewhat logical conclusion following a series of clues we the audience don't always have all those clues but um you can always follow his logic when he goes to explain it which i think does make him a, a decent detective yeah um yeah. i think he's um He's solid. The main thing is, like, the things that make him worse at being a detective are his explicit character flaws, which is that mm-hmm. he's a total man-child. The problem yep. is those are the parts of his character that have aged really, really weirdly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, oh. I-, I love to see a, a man-child cop tackling a man to the street. Oh, yeah, this is great. Mm. It's super fun to watch. The point is, it's like, I would want to be like, oh, yeah, Jakey boy, such a fun character. But then I'm like, eh, uh, well, uh... <laughs> A lot of these detectives kind of work because they're underdogs, you know? Like, right. And in this case, it's like, Jake has underdog energy, but then you look at the actual situation and you're like, oh, no, no, the power imbalance does not go both ways here. No, so, not at all. It's, I, uh... I feel like we would be justified in putting him as low as, like, C, because he's not yeah. an actually bad detective like Dick Gumshoe, but, like, he's eh, he's got enough extra baggage I mm-hmm. feel like we could put him down there. Yeah, I would. I would agree with you. I think you saw Lucy. Uh, he's certainly like an entertaining character, but yeah. I don't know if he's entertaining because he's a detective. Um, and and he's definitely a detective. He but is. whether or not he's a good one is hard to. Well, he, he's a good detective. But whether he is a good detective character is hard to suss from his particular show. And like you mentioned, the baggage that comes with it is a uh, rough time. Yep. And on that note, our next detective significantly oh more unproblematic uh is it is it wait is it was i not paying enough attention during the movie it's detective no, I pikachu just, I, just think, <laughs> I don't think this is really problematic i just think it's funny that it exists uh <laughs> detective pikachu detective pikachu he's Let's a detective about... who's also pikachu. <laughs> also pikachu and he was voiced by ryan reynolds yay so uh, Does Detective Pikachu actually uh, solve any mysteries in that movie? Well, there's the one ongoing, <laughs> the missing father. I think he uh, he solves that yeah. like halfway, and then the the kid solves it. The rest, okay. Look, real talk. I watched Detective Pikachu, but I was not like a Pokemon kid, uh, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I think it didn't get into my brain at the right formative time. So I was watching it, and I was like, this movie would probably be more fun. If I had been a Pokemon kid, <laughs> instead was it was just kid. okay. Um, and I would also agree that it was just okay. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> I think like uh, it looked cool. I think that was the main selling point. It looked mm-hmm. really pretty. I really liked how they integrated Pokemon into the background. But like for me, I was like, I had to remind myself that those weren't just like regular animals. I wasn't going like, <laughs> well, look, it's a Snorlax in the middle of the street. Wow, that's crazy. Like, you know, I, I didn't have that instinct. I was just uh-huh, like, it's uh-huh. on the road. Get out of here. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I know he's got detective in his title, <laughs> and he certainly does solve a single mystery at least once. And I know that there's a also, I just feel like we should approach this, a Detective Pikachu game as well. I never played the game, so I can't really speak to his characterization in there. Yeah, I um, also never did that. And does Pikachu look adorable in his little hat? Yeah, sure absolutely. Does. <laughs> does that make him a good detective? Uh, he's an electric mouse voiced by ryan reynolds it's a it's a hard line to tr- straddle there yeah um and i don't know if he necessarily has any investigative method specifically he drinks coffee and he's very sassy but oh, he also sort of um battles because he's a pokemon <laughs> so. i'm sorry i just realized the complete missed opportunity in that movie we never got like a poirot style lineup where he gets everyone in a room together and lectures at them but every time we cut to the wide shot he's just making adorable pikachu <sighs> noises <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that is oh that's so disappointing i'm so mad that doesn't exist yeah right i can't believe we don't live in that timeline no. it's terrible uh, 
All right, I think for that reason alone, we should put him in, like, C or D tier. Yeah, yeah, look, I love Detective Pikachu, but is he a good detective? No. No, I would even put him maybe in D tier. We can't even figure out who he is. (laughs) That's his whole, that's the mystery he solves, is who he is. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Whatever. There he goes. Yeah, that's fine. It's not even really a mystery movie that he's in, so it's okay. Uh, Next up, we gotta dip into a little Marvel, I think. A little Uh, kind of old fun. Just just a smidge for once to counterbalance the uh, all the DCs on here. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about a talk about our our lady Jessica Jones. Yeah, now love a little alliteration. Yeah, superheroes are like that. I know she's got comics. I have not read them, and I have not Mm -hmm. watched all of the show. Um. I will say, Jessica Jones actually follows the plot format of a detective. She tries to she solve crimes and shit. Like, she actually does. She doesn't go out and, like, punch people so much. Yeah. So, I yeah, think she's I would pretty say solid. Pretty solid. Of, like, the Marvel potential detective characters, she's definitely up there. One of the better ones. Uh, and she does, as you meant, I've read a few of her comic runs, not all of them. She's not one of my personal favorite Marvel characters, but I do enjoy her stuff quite a bit uh, when I have come across it. And she pretty much pretty consistent to how she is in the show. Um, yeah. I would I would say she's pretty high. I don't know. I mean, she could certainly rock a trench coat. No she doubt. Could, but she doesn't. She has a, she typically does. like a she scarf and leather jacket. jacket. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I also feel lot. like. Jessica Jones and John Constantine have similar levels of like baggage. Mm-hmm. Um, I think yes. honestly, she doesn't have quite as much. John Constantine has so much baggage. That man cannot walk ten feet without being haunted by the ghost of a dead yes. lover. Or John something. Constantine's character is basically defined by how much baggage they can give one man in any given comic run. Right. Jessica Jones has baggage that defines her character, and it certainly weighs on her. Um, but it is not the only thing about her. <laughs> like, she does actually actively solve mysteries related to crimes. Mm-hmm. Despite the baggage. Right. So I am inclined to put her in, like, B or C tier. Uh, like, mm-hmm. she's solid. Uh, I think she's not, like, a platonic ideal detective. But she's right. pretty hard-boiled, honestly. Like, she's a very solid hard-boiled detective in an era that doesn't really have them anymore. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would maybe lean. It's tough. I I don't know between B and C where I would fall. I'd maybe put her on the Tintin line in the middle. Okay. Because I we have some pretty uh, uh, you know, I just want to see. I just want Tintin to have a friend. Let's put it. Let's put it right in that straddle that line. We can we can she's you know bit, tighten it up later. I think she's a bit depressing for Tintin to be completely honest. Hey, I, you know what? They can be bros. They could really bring out the best of each other. Tintin could teach her to look on the lighter side of life and. And she could teach him how to not get knocked out at the end of every <laughs> single... <laughs> Again, I know nothing about Tintin except for what Red has told me on the stream, yeah. but I assume... <laughs> just the bare minimum of a self-defense training. Just something. Yeah. Just a little bit of situational awareness. Just a little bit of... Not little investigating bit of docks at night when nobody knows where you are. <laughs> they could right. wear leather jackets together. They could uh, ride bikes together like they did in the trailer for the movie. Tintin is more of a half-length blue sweater type than... Uh... Leather jacket. Okay, next up. I want that fan art on my desk by Monday, people. No. <laughs> next up, Eddie Valiant from oh, this one's good. Who Framed oh, Roger Rabbit. I, Woo! Really glad you added this to the list because I have completely forgot about him, but he's an excellent yeah, detective, yeah. and I'm here to defend that point. Who Framed Roger so Rabbit. Good. He is excellent such movie. a good detective. That movie is really good. Um, Eddie Valiant is definitely, I, I will say, as excellent a character as he is, I worry... He is maybe not the best detective because, similar to Sam Spade, a lot of things just kind of happen around him. Uh, Mm. He'll, like, investigate partway, and then just stuff will happen that he had no idea was going on. And I believe even at the end, when the big reveal about who killed his brother happens, like, that's a villain monologue. He didn't figure that out beforehand. (laughs) Um, But he is quite good. I, I would not put him below... B tier, I think. Just like he's a very solid detective, and he doesn't have a lot else going on in his life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would. I would agree. I think. You know, I think the thing, the thing that's catching us and it, it catches us with Sam Spade, but uh, obviously Sam Spade's got some other stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, too is that a lot of these noir style detectives? Because Eddie Valiant is, of course, based on like a classic like noir hard boiled detective. Um, 
they a lot of noir plots for movies do tend to just sort of happen to them. There's yeah. I can't think of like a very good example of that type of detective who really is active in solving the crime so much as it is just getting them from location to location. And that's echoed in a lot of the not so much in Robert Ra- Roger Rabbit, but in um God, I've really lost the ability to speak. <laughs> not, not so much in Roger Rabbit. Uh but is in more more classic noir films like uh, the Maltese Falcon. You know, the editing is very quick. We don't watch people walk down the street. We they exit a room and then we cut to the next location they're in. Right. And and because we are moving so quickly from location to location, uh, it's not about getting us to that point and seeing them figure out where they need to go next. We want to just see them go where they need to go next. And mm. because of that, things tend to just sort of happen to them. Uh, and, and I think Eddie yeah. Valiant does do a little bit more than the average hard-boiled detective, but he does, he is in the movie about cartoons that are getting murdered, so yeah. he's, he's more of a, a device for the audience to put all the clues together, more so than it is we need to see him put all the clues together. He just needs to show up where the audience needs to be viewing next. Yeah, that's fair. I think he is a pretty solid detective, just in the sense yeah. that, like, y- you know... He, he is a detective. He takes cases. Mm-hmm. He figures out something hinky's going on, and uh, he helps him figure out what it is. I, I think overall, you know, he's not he's not bad at it. Usually when things surprise him, it's because it's like weird tune stuff, which he doesn't mm-hmm. really understand all that well. So I, I think that kind of works to make him serve as like a fish out of water for us. Um, right. So I, I think we could put him in B tier and probably call it. Yeah, I would agree. I think yeah. he's solidly up there. He's not quite as iconic as like the A tiers and S tiers have been, um, but he, he's definitely a good detective. So B tier yeah. feels fair. He's fun, and that movie is oh. good. And the movie's excellent. Another. Let me just put this <laughs> bad boy in here. I believe this is one of your uh, big picks. It was, yeah. Uh, and I believe you are not very familiar with this character. <laughs> I am not. Here Despite is. Netflix's attempts to get me to watch these movies, uh, I so Netflix has been trying to get me to watch three things recently because um, I watched one season of Demon Slayer. So it's like, would you like One Piece, uh, Lupin the Third, or <laughs> Osmosis Jones? And I don't really know where <laughs> Osmosis Jones is coming from, but Lupin the Third is what we're here to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, caveat: there is a massive amount of Lupin the Third media out there, and I have only watched some of it. Uh, there was like a show. That was done by the the animation studio that would become Studio Ghibli afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been about a million movies, several of which done by completely different studios, some of which done by completely different voice casts. It's just weird. Um, the uh, the gist, the premise of the Lupin the Third franchise is that the main character, Lupin the Third, uh, is the grandson of uh, legendary thief Arsene Lupin. Uh, or Lupin, I guess. Whatever. You know what I mean. <laughs> well, who cares? French. Yeah, French. Bah. Uh, oh, my old enemy. <laughs> um, and uh, he's got his own little fun little crew of, like, ragtag misfits. And there is a detective after him, Inspector Zenigata, who is the descendant of a, like, Edo period legendary detective, also named Zenigata, uh, which I learned from Wikipedia half an hour before we started this stream. Um, yes. Uh, anyway, uh, now Zenigata is, ah! well, here's the problem. He is a good detective, but nobody else mm-hmm. seems to think so because he is basically oh, no. the only one who figures out that Lupin is behind stuff and everyone mm-hmm. else is always like, get out of here. We don't have time for this. We've got our own hijinks to do. Uh, so basically like typically what happens is there will be Lupin. And then there will be an explicit antagonist who is, like, a real bad person. And, like, they're after the same thing, or Lupin is after something the bad guy has. And then Zenigata will also show up and be chasing Lupin, and the bad guy will be like, ah, fuck, get this guy out of here. <laughs> um, so he's, like, he's not a bad detective exactly. Uh, he is very easy to fool with, like, shenanigans and rubber masks and stuff like that. Uh, mm-hmm. But also... Like, he gets very bummed out whenever it looks like Lupin is actually, like, caught or dead or, like, whatever. (laughs) And whenever Lupin fakes his death, he usually retires from being a detective for a while. (laughs) It only comes out of retirement when Lupin's like, I'm alive! And he's like, I knew it! Get over here! (laughs) So, it's very sweet. He's a fun character. He's like if Dick Gumshoe was actually competent, kind of. 
Um, so, well, I mean, I think that helps us rank him right there because it's, I mean, you know, he's he's a competent Dick Gumshoe. He's at least above D tier. Yeah, I mean, I the thing is, it feels weird to call him competent because he does get outsmarted on the reg, but he is also mm. the only person who even comes close to arresting Lupin. <laughs> so, Interesting. like. Yeah, I don't know. The thing is, like, Lupin is usually the first act antagonist, and then when the bad guy's true scheme is revealed, he almost always helps them in the third act. So, like, mm. he's, like, good at what he does, and what he does is, like, figuring out, all right, Lupin is not the problem right now. Let's go deal with the actual problem. Right. Um, I, it sounds like maybe he's sitting at C then. Like, he's... Yeah, I think we could swing a C. He's, like, he's really, really determined. He, like, doesn't give up unless Lupin is not in the equation anymore and he gets really bummed out. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's just, like, a class. He's, like, the fun nemesis. And then, you know, mm -hmm, when, mm -hmm. the, when the serious stuff happens, it's like, no, bring back Senegata. Uh, yeah, he's solid. Um, all right, so... Uh, oh, I see. We've added something. <laughs> this next one has been heavily requested by chat, and I absolutely agree with them. I can't believe I forgot to put them on the list, uh, right. especially after I the think. recent social media videos they've been dropping. All right, here we go. Let me just... Eh. Let's talk about our boy. Oops. This one goes out for all of you who grew up watching the exact same era of Blue's Clues as I did. Boop. Talk about Steve. Yeah! <laughs> talk about Steve. Oh, my heart. I'm in tears. Um... Well, let's first broach the subject. Is he a detective? What does a de detective do? A detective solves a mystery by following clues. What does Steve do? He follows clues. Heck yeah, he does. <laughs> solves a mystery. And, you know, he's got his Watson in the form of a blue dog. We love to see it. Man's best friend. Of course. Uh-huh, uh-huh. A cast of kooky side characters. Um, he helps. He really does help the audience walk through the mystery, you know? He, he really makes it clear that we can follow his reasoning and his logic. Oh, and uh, he I don't think he ever did, but I'm sure that Steve could rock a trench coat if he wanted to. <laughs> I don't think that's quite the vibe of Blue's Clues. No, but it, it's a vibe that I would like to see them <laughs> They do a special black and white episode with Venetian blinds on shadows. Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, the chat is loving this. <laughs> I mean, of course they are. Uh, so, full disclosure, I did not watch Blue's Clues <gasps> as a child. Um, largely because I did not watch television as a child. This wasn't up to oh me, guys. God. I just, I, I, I didn't, I don't know, I had books, stuff like that. Um, I mean, here's the thing. We have to decide on this tier list, like, Steve is definitely high up on it right at least i would say because he is by definition a detective who solves mysteries effectively because he is a 100 percent success <laughs> all right i mean i'm seeing a lot of s's uh, in chat so i'm seeing a lot of s's in chat and look i love steve he's my boy from childhood and i'm trying to think of a reason not to put him in s tier <laughs> and i'm having a lot of trouble think thinking of that reason uh the three and I big guess names hercule <laughs> poirot <laughs> I'm Red, Columbo. I want you to weigh in, but obviously you didn't see it. Watch Blue's Clues as a child, so if you could give me a reason for us not to put him in S tier, then we can put him lower. I mean... But I'm having trouble coming up with any off the dome. Well, look, here's the thing. Uh, because I didn't watch Blue's Clues, I don't really know what kind of mysteries he was solving. Well, so it like... wasn't murder mysteries, All I'll right. tell you that. Okay, that was my next question. He would typically he'd get a letter, he'd sing the letter song. Right. Um, and he would take out his handy dandy notebook and write down clues as they went about solving whatever problem of the day. Sometimes people would lose things. Mm -hmm. Um sometimes people would be uh, when I say people I mean like salt and pepper shakers and stuff. Oh uh, okay. would be would be, you know, having some sort of some problem that they needed to solve. It's been a while since I've watched Blues Clues, I'm gonna be real. So hmm. <laughs> it's been a minute since I've gone back to that one. Uh but the, the the show is all about sol following the clues to solve the mystery, uh, whatever that mystery may be. And I guess, uh, is a detective, do they have to solve a certain caliber of mystery? Or can a detective, you know, solve the, the little things, the day-to-day -day problems that people are dealing with? I mean, that is a good point. Although Chad is pointing out that he apparently always needs explicit audience participation to be able to figure out mysteries. 
which is a bit of a strike, That's true. I'd say. Um, That's true. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. Mm. I think we can put him in S if you want. We could also put him in no, A. No, no. We must we must be adherent to the the academic value of the tier list system. I love Steve, and while nostalgia goggles want me to put him in S, I do think he's probably closer to an A. Okay. <laughs> Maybe B. Perfect. Yeah. On par with Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> And the Scooby Gang and L. I feel like if we're gonna put, you know, <laughs> we're gonna put Batman in A tier, then we can put uh, Steve from Blue's Clues up there. I'm gonna get some strongly worded comments on this one. That's okay. All right, let's. We see. got so many strongly worded comments from the Himbo tier list. I just assume we're gonna get strongly worded comments on every tier list we do. That is entirely fair. Now, yes. looking at the list, we had basically a list of uh, detectives we wanted to put on the list on our first pass. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we had a few detectives left over for a second pass. Now, I believe we had an idea of using some of those as, like, pledge incentives. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't really want to just leave chat hanging for the foreseeable right. future. Right. So I think <laughs> what we could do is we could start with one of them and then discuss them until we hit a milestone. Like a pretty manageable yeah. one, like a hundred dollars additionally. Like uh like let's say we start the clock on that when we hit two point five, and then we move on to the next one when we hit two point six, or well if we get too tired, we just call it a night. Um <laughs> Yeah, I think we can get through the rest of the list um that we have here. Yeah. Uh assuming I, I so I say we start with that one up top. Yeah. And for every hundred dollars, we'll add another one till we run out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we can probably do that the thing is like we can't really yeah. do anything lower than that because the way it's currently showing uh doesn't show us anything lower than the hundreds place so uh, yeah and just a you know, reminder that like the money we're raising is to go help those who are yeah, impacted by hurricane among point. other causes uh, i feel like we should throw this disclaimer out there uh so if you if you want to support the cause uh regardless of the quality of our tier list uh, right. you should consider donating and if you guys do donate We'll do more detectives of yes. varying levels of detectiveness. <laughs> All right. So this one we have is uh, not from anything I've watched. So Yeah. So we're talking about um, Franny Fisher, Miss Fisher from Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries, uh, which is an absolutely excellent show. It is Australian, Ooh. which slaps. And the main detective in it is a hottie. But uh, also, <laughs> actually, that's true of every character in the show. But huh. um Miss Frischer, Franny Frischer, is sort of like a, a Miss Marple type, just sort of citizen who helps the police department solve mysteries in her free time because she's very invested in that sort of thing as a hobby. Hmm. Uh, but she's a bit more active than I would say Miss Marple is. She is much younger, for one thing, so she has the capability of tagging along when they're actually gathering clues. Hmm. And she has a sort of um, unofficial consulting relationship with the this one uh, inspector in her area. And it's also a period piece, so it takes place in, I think, like, the 1920s in Australia. It's a lot oh, of fun. Oh, neat. Um, and I think what I really like about Miss Fisher is that she's an independent woman. Uh, she's got a lot of, like, fun attitude to her, but she is also very intelligent, and she does sort of more of a, a uh, Miss Marple, Sherlock Holmes, uh, reading the person to try and solve the mystery. But she backs it up by going out and finding clues. Sweet. Um, I think she... Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I was going to say, real quick, we did pass the uh, 2.6 threshold, so we can move on to the next Ooh. one, whatever. Uh, nice. Uh, I would rate Miss Fisher pretty highly. I think she loses some points because sometimes she does have a little bit of help from the actual police department, but mm. she's typically the one who actually puts together all the clues and solves the mystery, and she gets herself out of a lot of scrapes, so I would put her in, like, A or B. All right, sounds good. Uh, there's more root. Oh, God, what did I just do? Hold on. <laughs> okay, we're good. There's more uh, room in the B tier, but uh, we can put her in A if you want. Uh, She's probably about on par with Miss Marple, honestly. So I would probably put her in B. Okay. I, I think if we're like if that, they fill a similar similar role in their respective shows. Uh, oh, although right. again, Miss Fisher is not an old woman and therefore able to. Do okay, <laughs> here we go. The next one you have is also not from media. I am. Other no, oh, oh, speaking of BBC murder mystery shows, uh, Father Brown is. Um, uh, like amateur detective except he's a priest it's that's basically the gist of it uh i i don't know he's he's fun he's not my favorite of the bbc detectives uh mm. he does solve mysteries uh similar ways to miss marple does 
Um, and he's a likable enough character. I think he's pretty good success rate. Probably put him in like a B tier. You Sounds know? good. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, we hit 2.7. All right, he's going to B tier. Moving on. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, we got another one. This one is, oh, man. It's just uh, not as fast. Squeeze. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, God, this is difficult. Uh, okay. You're never going to believe this. This is also not one I'm familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, this one... Uh... So Philip Marlowe is kind of iconic in that he is ex- an exemplary, uh, hard-boiled detective, which means that, um, Red, you'll be thrilled to know he suffers from a lot of the same problems <laughs> the same Well, we haven't had an uh, F-tier yet, so... I, I don't think he's F-tier. I, honestly, luckily, we... I, <laughs> none of our detectives have been so problematic that I would put them that low. Uh, he, he's iconic. He's LA's toughest detective. He's definitely, like, if you had to describe the hard-boiled detective, he's ticking all those boxes. Hmm. But because of that, he is also ticking all the boxes that you dislike in Sam Spade. And I have to tend to agree with you that he sort of just, like, has the plot happen to him. And Hmm. that happens to have him solve the mystery by being in the right place at the right time. So I would rank him uh, pretty low as well. And again, I love the hard-boiled detective trope. Yeah. Not well, the best strategy if you want to solve a mystery on your own. <laughs> no, not so much. Uh, we could probably put him in D tier, honestly, sounds like. Yeah, I would I would put him down there. Yeah, that makes He's sense. He's probably sitting with our, our boy Spam. Our boy uh, Sam. There we go. Get in there, you crazy kid. All right, let's see. Uh, Oh, great. This is also... Oh my god, do I not know any of these? Do you not know any of these? Oh, Which I... one is up next? Yeah. 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 Well, this is going to be fun. Uh, <laughs> We're getting Indigo's very exhausted. Uh, I know quick... one of these, but it's a couple. <laughs> it's a couple lists away. Um, Do you want to skip to them? No, I, it, no, this is fine. Uh, okay. We're already going to be confused if we. Uh, let's see. I think we haven't technically hit the threshold, but that's okay. Who is this one again? <laughs> just... Okay. I'm waiting for the text to appear on screen because I'm going to be honest, I lost track of where in the list we are. <laughs> That's okay. It's uh, it's up on my end, so whenever the latency mm-hmm. for, uh, allows, do, 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 see if there's any interesting ones in the chat. Oh, let me add a couple. No, wait. That's fine. <laughs> Oh boy! All right. Hmm. Okay, let's do this, Jazz. Oh. Um, it still has not popped up. On <laughs> That's okay. I mean, it's it's Magnum PI. Oh, there we go. Yeah, Magnum PI. Okay. Uh, Magnum PI. I don't know if he's that good of a segment. He's so he is like the um Florida man of uh, procedural TV. <laughs> All right, what what show is he I from? I know he's not from Florida. From Magnum P.I. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> and from 1980 to 1988. Uh, Whoop. We just it's, got $100 more. It's almost more of... Oh, nice. It's almost more of an action show. It's set in Hawaii. Okay. Uh, it's almost more of an action show than it is a, a straight mystery show, and it's really more of a procedural, so we're running into some of the problems that we have at the BAU here. He is a private eye, Thomas Magnum. He was all over Oahu's writing wrongs, <laughs> as his Wikipedia says. Um... But he also is like a rich man and sort of like celebrity author, man of many talents who huh. just sort of is able to, to figure things out. Sometimes by shooting his way out and sometimes by actually solving the mystery. I wouldn't put him that high up, for <laughs> being honest. He's certainly an entertaining character. His show veers a lot more into like action comedy than it does mm. mystery solving. And that does make him suffer a little bit as a detective. That sounds like I would maybe might... put him in like... Yeah, sorry. Well, he might go as low as E, honestly, if that's the case. Uh, uh I don't know if I put him quite down there with E's <laughs> K. Okay, sorry. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> Chat just pointed out another one that I'm gonna add. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> we've got a bunch that I know now. Yeah, we'll we'll skip to one of those next. Uh, well, no, we I would, I would maybe put him in like D with like Sam Gumshoe and Dick Gumshoe because he's not. Yeah. He's not quite as like, I'm gonna punch my way. He is a PI. He does try to solve mysteries. He just usually ends the mystery solving it by like having a shootout. <laughs> All right. Okay. How about we skip just the next one and hit the one after that, which I do know? Yeah, we can do that. That sounds good. All right. I've kind of lost about... track of the uh, just a sec. 
I've sort of lost mm-hmm. track of wh- which milestone we're on, but I think, uh, well, well, this one's kind of got a lot to discuss, so we can move on from this mm-hmm, one mm-hmm. after. Yeah, if, we, if, we, one, if so. we hit 2.9, we'll move on to another one after this next one. Yeah, uh, so for I've, seen, now. I've seen some comments about this one, and they're a good point. Yeah. Uh, he is, Rick Deckard, is a pretty classic detective who just happens yeah. to be in a cyberpunk future setting. Um, Heck yeah. Yeah, so... And um, I feel like I should point this out before we get into too much of the actual nuanced discussion. He does rock a trench coat. He uh, does? So we're just gonna sure go does. ahead and check that box off right now. Hell yeah. No, he's he's good with the trench coat. He's good with the mystery mm-hmm. solving. Depending on which cut of the movie you watch, he's constantly yep. monologuing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's such a classic. No, I mean, there's the femme fatale. There's the... There's the mm-hmm. monologues, there's the rain, there's the substance abuse issues. I mean, man, it's just textbook. Uh, the question is, is Rick Deckard an actually good detective? Yes, it's, you know, it's a it's a tricky question to answer because he certainly does detective e things in unraveling a mystery underlying his entire society, but he's technically a bounty hunter. Yeah. Not necessarily like a pure detective. Um, he's... Oops. Not as like he has to solve, um, you know, different. He has to put clues together to get to his hits, but they are hits, yeah. <laughs> not mysteries. Uh, and yeah. he does. He is kind of a and, hit man. He is kind of a hit man, and because he is a kind of a inspired by a lot of noir detectives, he does sometimes not not as much as a lot of the actual noir detectives but he does sort of suffer from being moved to being in the right place at the right time for the plot to progress and the mystery to be unraveled mm. he's much more active than they are i would argue yeah. uh, at least if you're going by the film version um he also doesn't seem to be a good enough detective to figure out he's definitely the antagonist in this story <laughs> so yeah I'd be inclined to put him as low as like honestly he's he's pretty solid i'd put him as low as c tier uh, mm-hmm. just cause, uh, I think there's room. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I would, I would, I don't think he's enough of a detective to be placed higher, like B or higher. So I would say C is the highest we could go for him. Makes sense. Um, I don't think he's actively bad at solving mysteries. No, when, I, he's at least the one mystery he does solve. So I wouldn't right. put him in the D tier with like Dick Gumshoe and right. all of them, but I don't think he's necessarily any better than C. So I think C is probably a, a oh, safe okay. place to, to, to stick him. And we did hit 2.9, so we will be doing another one. Yep, we're moving so we're on. Like, uh, I you don't get us know pre-K? either of the next two on this list, or technically the third one, but I at least know the third one exists. Uh, Which one do you okay. want to do? I would love to talk about the next one on the list because okay. I think that we need to get we gotta wrap my boy. I've seen him in chat a few times. All um, right, I'm putting it up. And I did just watch Shang Chi like six hours ago, so I'm in a wuxia kind of state of mind. Okay. Uh, so we've mentioned how there are a lot of characters inspired by Sherlock Holmes, and uh, this does not mean just in Western media. There, <laughs> sometimes you get characters who are adaptations of Sherlock Holmes, but in um, Fictional, fictional, somewhat mystical, like feudal China. And that is where Detective D comes in. This man is in a variety of wuxia movies, which are martial arts um, films that are usually have some sort of uh, fantastical historical element in them. Uh, so not only is he an incredibly skilled martial artist, but also this guy is like doing Sherlock Holmes stuff and solving mysteries. His, I think the first movie that came out um, was called Mystery of the Phantom Flame. And in it, Detective Ooh. D is trying to solve the mystery of why all these random officials are randomly... Um, succumbing to human combustion <laughs> what so there's a lot of like and i think this is where he's gonna lose some points there's a lot of mystic elements to his films um because oh, again they're it, they're very rad but sometimes that does mean that the problem is solved by uh magic not necessarily putting all the clues together i mean no uh, complaints uh he's not on this list i think but there is a detective uh from a series of novels by randall garrett called uh lord darcy who basically solves mysteries in an alternate history London where magic is real. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. no complaints from me. Yeah, obviously. no, no complaints from the magic aspect. I mean, like, we've got some magic-related folks on here already. And I do like that one of the things that's consistent about his character is he is actually a skilled investigator. He is Detective D. Right. Uh, <laughs> Jin Jie. Uh, and um, he does typically go about trying to figure out... Yes, people are exploding chat. Keep up. Yeah. He does go about... <laughs> 
about solving the mystery initially. It, what usually happens is by the end of the movie, because it is a wuxia, it's a martial arts movie, the, right. the, the problem is solved by a, a showdown uh, of some kind. But to get to that showdown, he's got to put the clues together and figure out what's up. And that usually involves uh, in interrogating or questioning various uh, character actors who are doing various things. Maybe they operate a secret underground, possibly hell uh, potion market. Maybe they're <laughs> an official in the Emperor's Palace. We never know where we're going to end up. Uh, and it and it can be a little bit difficult to follow sometimes his point of logic, which is why I think he doesn't necessarily fit into like the A tier. Um, and he is definitely inspired by Sherlock Holmes in many ways. Hmm. So I would hesitate to put him as high as the character that he's drawing inspiration from. Uh, but I think he's a fun variant of Sherlock Holmes, which de- he deserves to be on the detective tier list. Um, and I I, I, th- I worry that the variant status is going to hurt him though because he is. Uh, not a particularly unique, other than the flavor uh, of his his movies being in a different genre. He doesn't necessarily uh, have anything that makes him a more unique detective than a lot of these B and C tier ones. Well, I have no way of judging because I had never even heard of this man before just now. So Yes, yeah, this is another movie recommendation added to the list of, right, of uh, Scooby-Doo, uh, <laughs> Knives Out. <laughs> Scooby-Doo, Two Monsters Unleashed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. also all the Detective D movies. All right, let's put him in B tier. Yeah, I'll say B tier is fair. Squeeze it out fair. really small to fit. Oh, that text in there. There you go. Uh, you, you can pick the next one we do because I, I, we have hit 3K, so we're doing, yeah, <laughs> we're doing let's another see. one. I don't know the next one. I don't know the one after that. I have not seen the show from the one after that, but I obviously know about them by reputation. Mm-hmm, I don't know mm-hmm. the one after that because I haven't played the games. Let's get to the one that is unconditionally one of mine. All right, add it up there. Talk, Red Talk. I'm doing <laughs> Tell it. Tell us about Just a second. Woo. All right. So, Sam Vimes from the Discworld series, specifically the Garth oh. novels. Uh, Sam Vimes fucking rules, and I'll take no argument on this. He's, uh, I mean, how to describe? Basically, while Terry Pratchett was writing the Discworld novels, initially when he introduced the guards, it was like he was kind of making parodies of classic fantasy at the time, wherein city mm-hmm. guards only existed to be like faceless mooks, Easily outwitted. I used to be an adventurer or... like you. Exactly. And I took an arrow to the knee. Yeah, no, exactly. Oh, somebody stole your sweet doll. <laughs> yeah, so basically they were walking jokes. Uh, just existed. Uh, let's see. I think they're, the first time they're referenced is in... Uh, oh, what's it called? Um, how am I forgetting this? Uh, Weird Sisters, uh, the witch's ah. novel, uh, where we briefly see one of the characters in Ankh Morpork, and it mentions... Uh, there's a guard uh, outside the window ringing the bell to say, like, 11 o'clock and all's well before immediately getting <laughs> mugged. And it's like, okay, cool. Um, so, but then basically as he was exploring this, he kind of started actually exploring those characters a little bit. And that's when he started on the guards novels, where basically the main character, Sam Vimes, is like, he's like the hard-boiled noir detective but like at the absolute end of his rope like everything sucks he's running the night mm-hmm. watch and the night watch like the day watch at least they get a little respect but the night watch only exists to get like beat up by like thieves or you know outwitted by guards etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's just a total mess and over the course of that book uh thanks to the introduction of a new character captain carrot who's not yet a captain uh and a dragon and this nice lady he meets, uh, basically everything works out for him and he slowly starts being okay and climbing the social ladder against his will <laughs> because uh, <laughs> the city patrician keeps giving him promotions because he's really, really good at oh. keeping all the rich people in line. It's fantastic. <laughs> uh, Sam Vimes is a pretty solid detective, but he is much better at never, ever giving up on anything. Um, he's mm. just like, ah, oh, just iron-willed, uh, which is great and I love it. Um, I think that Sam Vimes is pretty good at figuring stuff out sometimes, but he has enough other stuff going on that that kind of takes a back seat sometimes. Not to the point of some of these characters where it's like they're allegedly a detective, mm-hmm. but really all they do is punching. No, 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 none of that. Uh, he actually does do mystery solving. I would be completely fine putting him in A tier because he's great, uh, but I understand if that's not a universally accepted opinion. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
Uh, I haven't read enough of the uh, Guards Guards novels to really weigh in on this too too much, but uh, I, I'm comfortable putting him in A tier. I also saw a few messages in chat that said he would be hate he would hate being placed high up, which makes me think that we <laughs> should put him. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, that that is one of Sam's uh, most co- solid character traits is that he thinks he's like just a simple guard who just is trying to do the right thing, and he keeps getting like lordships and knighthoods and promotions and more and more political power, <laughs> and he hates it. And it's really annoying. Uh, there's also one book where he travels back in time to the plot of Les Mis. Uh, oh, excellent. And it's really, really good. Anyway, so that's my boy. We hit 3.1K because somebody donated $100 all at once. Uh, do you want to pick the next one? Yeah, I'll do one. Th- I'll, let's do a, you know, this is another one of those uh, procedural duos, uh, kind of iconic. We'll oh, do a okay. Mulder and Scully, because I think Hell that even yeah. if you have not seen much of the show, you probably have a little bit of a grasp on what their whole deal is. Just a smidge. Um, I've seen the memes, I believe. Uh, yeah, look, the X-Files, if there's one thing I respect in this world, is their dedication to never once updating the intro to their show. It is the same incredibly <laughs> questionable <laughs> CGI with the word extraterrestrials pushing forward into the screen as do 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 Perfect. plays in the background. I love it. I could watch it for hours. Um, Mulder and Scully are uh, FBI agents. They're tasked with investigating the X Files, which of course typically mean um, a paranormal or alien or some sort of questionable, mysterious cases. But of course, Ooh. nobody believes that it could possibly be actually aliens or extraterrestrials or anything, except for, of course, um, Fox Mulder, who is the true believer, and Scully, who is the skeptic. And that mm-hmm. sort of is their duo dynamic. Anyone who has seen BuzzFeed Unsolved is familiar with the type of dynamic. Um, oh, it is exactly that. It's exactly that, except scripted. Um, and, uh, you know, the, every episode, it's procedural, so they go about solving various mysteries investigating various happenings and i will say more so than many procedurals they do actually do a lot of on the ground investigation um because in order to help the audience figure out whatever paranormal happenings are happening um we do see a lot of the some cases the villain going about their villainous deeds but in some cases the villain is like oh werewolf (laughs) or aliens so we don't necessarily explicitly see what's going on and it's a bit more mysterious than your average procedural Uh, um chat seems to think about as highly of them as they think of team rocket in terms of (laughs) villainy effectiveness so i've seen some calls for d tier here's the thing while they certainly are fbi agents investigating mysteries because of the nature of the mysteries they're investigating a lot of times anytime they actually make progress on unraveling the overarching who's who are aliens real who's pulling the strings thing um they get their memory wiped Uh, or, or abducted or something and so like while they're um more anthology episodes they're certainly very capable teams they rarely have any concrete proof of whatever they're actually investigating Goalie pretty much remains a skeptic for the entire series, despite being abducted by aliens multiple times. Um, and Mulder can get nobody to believe him, no matter what's going on. So I would actually tend to, while I love the X Files, I don't think that they're particularly good detectives because they very rarely are able to actually detect anything. That's so funny. Should we put them in E tier? Or mmm, mmm. <laughs> It doesn't really you know, sound like they solve anything. You know, you might have to put them in each <laughs> Hell yeah, get in there, you. Yeah, you they r- they kid. rarely catch the any sort of like killer or bad guy. They rarely like they something they often Mulder will solve the mystery but not tell Scully or like oh. Scully will be like, mm, I don't know, I believe what you think is happening. It's a ugh. Right. It's a delightful show, but is it an effective uh, crime prevention method? <laughs> no, I absolutely think not. not. Now, uh, oh crap, okay, so now we had $200 <laughs> donations, uh, so how about we real quick breeze through two of mine that I, actually, hold on, you watched Gargoyles. I watched Gargoyles, yeah, so, let's do that one. Okay, yeah, perfect. Uh, the thing is, we can also rush through one if you want, because we have two ones queued up, so we can just move on. Okay. Uh, so I if- can do one in about two sentences, and then we could do let's the Gargoyles do one. Who is it? Yeah, I, I popped up in chat a few times. Uh, Longmire from the show Longmire. Right. He is a police chief in a small western town. Um, basically, cowboy. Uh, not quite Sherlock Holmes, but like a in skilled investigator. He's the the chief of police. He's very stoic. He wears a cowboy hat all the time, and he Hell solves yeah. crimes. Yeah, he's very good at solving the crimes. He pretty much always solves them, although sometimes they last for a few episodes. 
Uh, and he's got a lot of charisma and charm. And because it's a procedural, you usually are following along with him as you solve the mystery. So the audience can check it out. I put him as a solid, like, C or B tier. I All think right. he's a lot of fun. The last couple seasons of the show weren't great, but all his books are really good. So hmm. Let me, uh... maybe C, because I'm... I think we have more room. There. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just making the space. All right, let's pop him yeah, in there. Look, I like him a lot, but, you know, he's not necessarily any more of a standout than any other one. Uh, right. and... and next up is as soon as i get the source working yeehaw detective indeed there she is elisa maza from gargoyles now this is a great character she's really fun and i really like her is she actually a good detective Mm, that's certainly debatable (laughs) it is unfortunately (laughs) like she also kind of just like being a detective is her day job but like most of the Mm -hmm. plot is about the gargoyles (laughs) Yeah, while her day job might be a detective, most of the plot happens at night. Yeah, yeah, by definition. I think she's okay, but I don't think we really Mm -hmm. ever see her... Well, because here's the problem. Whenever she's off doing, like, police work that doesn't have anything to do with the gargoyles, uh, we never see it. And whenever she's going after Xanatos, she never wins, because (laughs) that would be Mm -hmm. illegal. Um and most of the time when she's engaging with the plot, it's because she's not doing her job being a detective. Um, right. So, I I mean, she's such a good character, though. But, like, I think we could easily put her down in D tier, to be completely honest. Uh, just in terms of, like, she seems like a fine detective. We just never get to see it, really. Right. I, I would agree with you. I think, you know, she's ostensibly a good detective but because the show is not really about her doing detective things yeah we don't have i don't think i have enough information to put her higher up on the list they also uh, give her so like would... a partner for a while who is like i'll tell you something detective maza i think something weird's going on in this town and she's like haha what nuh-uh hey look over there <laughs> Which Certainly not all so the statues fun. on this building turning into real life gargoyles every night, but I'm not. Gonna... No, what? <laughs> that would be silly. I'm not dating that one. Don't, don't get over here. Possible. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, I know. I think I think put her in D tier. Yeah, yeah, she's a great character. Yeah. But great character, like... mad detective. Nah, nah. Okay, let's see. Uh, well, I've got one. Uh, right. You've got bottom. one. Throw that up there. Alrighty, let's do it. Eh. This one is going to be interesting. After this, we might need to start taking more direct. Um, from the uh, chat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. Another French one. Oh, God. The there French. he is. Chase Devineau from <laughs> uh, from uh, Carmen San Diego. Oh, heck yeah. Woo. Yeah. He, uh, in case you don't remember, he's the one who is constantly going, <gasps> La Femme Rouge! Because he's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, he is, he he is, is. Uh, unfortunately similar boat to Zenigata. Uh, mm-hmm. the, uh, the fact is that in that show the thief is the main character so the detective can never really be painted in a particularly good light although Devino mostly just gets the fact that he literally never ever gives up which is another Zenigata classic um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I believe the he problem he is somewhat bumbling yeah he is kind- well here's the problem for most of the show, he is kind of on team, oh, La Femme Rouge, wow, she's being so evil right now. And then eventually he's like, wait a minute, maybe my partner was actually onto something and may- maybe she's not actually evil? That's weird. And it's like, it takes him so long to get there. Mm-hmm. To the point where they're like formulating conspiracy theories on how La Femme Rouge is like playing all the sides. It's like, dude, she's just hanging out. All right, leave her alone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I tend to agree. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't put him that high up. I, I, like he's definitely a detective, and I outside of La Femme Rouge related <laughs> crimes, I'm not quite sure how skilled he is. It's hard to say. Um, but he's not great at the La Femme Rouge stuff. Chat I can't did say point that, out that he finds vile like headquarters, which is pretty impressive. It's true, but that's like one thing. <laughs> Yes, and one thing does not an excellent detective mate. I would probably put him in, like, D, maybe. Yeah, I think we can squeeze him in. Just, uh... Yeah. Make him real small. Let's put in these put guys. Put him on in there. Just... Excellent. Maybe I can nudge Sam Spade surreptitiously farther down and squeeze in Philip Marlowe <laughs> over him. No one will. Reg- 
Like a cat about to push a, a glass of water <laughs> off of the side of a table, Red has been slowly edging Sam's <laughs> more know. and more to eat here. It's what he deserves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trash man. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Chase Devin all. Chase Devin all. And I think that we're sitting pretty sit sitting pretty at 3.4, so we're probably going to yeah. maybe be wrapping this up around here. Most likely. Um, I will say we had one more person on the list who is not from anything I'd watched, but you put them on there. We can do that uh, if you want. Ah, that's probably okay. uh, a, a certain detective of the pet variety. I mean, we don't have uh, to. You know, we sh we should probably just touch on him real quick because yeah, uh, I think it's pretty pretty something. easy to put him in this one. Might want to leave a little room in D tier. Uh, so we got, of course, uh, <laughs> foreshadowing. <laughs> Ace Ventura, pet detective, and I think that the reason that I I'm going to say right out the gate, I think he's a D tier, is because while he certainly solves pet related crimes uh, skillfully, he is a comedic character similar to. Um, Inspector Clouseau and Dick Gumshoe, mm. and while that doesn't necessarily make him a bad detective, it doesn't necessarily make him a good one either. He's fun. I love him. I mean, like, come on. It's uh, Eggman himself. Uh, -huh. uh You know, that uh, leading man really good. Jim Carrey. That movie was really good. We don't have time to talk about it now. We absolutely <laughs> we do. Well, for yeah. hours. Um, if we hit no, 4,000 like, in the next two minutes, we'll talk about the Sonic movie. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm speaking it. it into existence. Uh, like, Jim Carrey is a delight to watch work, and the Ace Ventura stuff is a lot of fun, but I don't necessarily think that makes him a good detective. He's a little bumbling. He's definitely a comedic character. I think it's a similar to Inspector, Clu Inspector Clouseau situation where he's falling into that D tier just because he is playing a good detective for comedy can be a lot of fun and very effective but it does not a good de detective mate mm. detective make wow i have lost progressively more and more syllables <laughs> and we have to record a podcast in like 12 hours that's okay yeah <sighs> good all righty oh chat is pointing out uh ace ventura might go in the f tier for transphobia reasons uh mm, that's definitely that's... in the uh aged poorly but uh yeah Yes, shall shall not... we finally put someone in the F tier? Yeah, why not? Do it for chat. Oh my god. Uh, I think the 4K thing might actually happen. Someone just put in $200. <laughs> well, if that happens, we can talk about fun things. Let's see. Sonic. Sonic, yeah. But while we're waiting... Completely unrelated to the plot. <laughs> well, the after I mean, the main character, that guy's a cop. That's kind of like a detective. Let's see, are we missing yeah, anybody? Right, let's throw... Oh, we yeah. Got Ace Ventura goes down an F. Um, You've got, uh, you got Professor Layton on here. Um, oh, yeah, I saw him pop up in chat a few times. Um, well, since we already hit, you know, I two more milestones, it, yeah. we may as well pop we're up. Already, in we're already in this. Yeah, Professor Layton is a, um archaeology professor who in the the Professor Layton video games, you, you kind of play as him sort of in third-person perspective, and you go around and you solve... Uh, Various very complex, uh, nuanced mysteries with your um, boy detective partner and various other side characters. Uh, I I think he's a decent detective because Professor Layton does every game solve the mystery and it's more or less always him f putting it all together. He's not a very active detective, and a part of that might be because he is in a video game where basically the way you play is you walk around and you get handed puzzles and then you solve puzzles. So mm. everyone always has excuses in the game to be handing you puzzles at like two a.m. in a dark street. Um, <laughs> So while well, typically it's always implied that the character Professor Layton certainly has put all the clues together himself, um, because you the the player are trying to solve the mystery actively alongside them, typically it's not said out loud what he's put together until it is immediately relevant. Um, gotcha. I think he's he is a pretty good detective. He's definitely good at detecting things, and he does put clues together in a very like uh, Sherlock Holmesian way. Um, I think probably so squeeze him B tier, honestly. I was gonna say I think he's probably a B tier. I think it's, I'm trying to separate him from gameplay restrictions, but mm. I don't know if it's totally possible to do that entirely because of the structure of the media that he's in. So I would say B tier is probably a pretty safe place to uh, right. to stick him. Just shrink yeah. everybody down. <laughs> there mm. <he> goes. <laughs> Here we go again on our own. Yes, we need more trash detectives on this list. The F tier is looking pretty cold. Oh no! Well, you know, if you want to be a detective, you gotta. Gotta try and not be trash, man. <laughs> oh man, we're only two hundred dollars away from our Sonic tier. Oh. Sonic tier. Let's see if there's anybody we skipped over on the main thing. Oh, we just hit four K. What? <laughs> <laughs> Guys. We, we gotta talk about. Aw, you crazy <laughs> kids! Oh my god, we actually hit four point two K because two people donated the the winning amount. All right. Well, thank you all for donating so much to uh, this charity, and yeah. feel free to continue to, to donate. We're you know hopefully gonna be able to help out those who have been affected by Hurricane Ida. 
Um, I, I live in New York City, and while we certainly didn't get it as bad as some uh, more southern parts of the country, um, Louisiana in particular is, you know, well, uh, particularly hit by this. You know, it's a lot of flooding is very dangerous. There's not yeah. a lot of infrastructure in place to deal with it. And anything we can do to help those affected by it is great. So we really do appreciate that. Uh, and speaking of that, um, Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, speaking of that. Across much of the road. <laughs> just going to, no, no, keep talking. I've just got to add a little bit of text to, to just really get in the, get in the zone. Yeah, so um, here's the thing about Sonic. It's uh-huh. a great example of how we, the fans, have a lot of power and also the ability to make people in the film industry work horrendous overtime hours, uh, but luckily most people are union, except in VFX houses. Remember when Yay! Sonic the Hedgehog had terrifying human teeth and then they changed it for the movie? Because I do, because it was I like do. three years ago. <laughs> Two years ago. Oh, jeez. Yeah, that was a good Oh, sense. man. Um. It's a, you know, I'm a little mad that, that movie was as fun as it was because it was kind of a good time. <laughs> All right, here we go. I just got to make the text big enough. <laughs> oh, no. Don't worry, it's good. Everything's fine and normal. <laughs> Mm-hmm. We're all so good. red. I, I question for you is how much exposure to Sonic did you have before you watched the movie? Because I have a very specific history with the character uh, re-watching the movie. I what? did encounter him somewhat as a child, but not much to be completely honest. I mean, I had like mild exposure to uh, the games as a concept, mm-hmm. but you know, not. I didn't really play them that much. Uh, I knew about them, obviously. You can't really. Go. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Has it has it updated? It just popped up. Yeah. Perfect. Um, there we go. Incredible. Uh-huh, All right. Uh-huh. I haven't really gone. <laughs> I'm watching your edits in real time. This is great. Continue. Continue. I mean, Tell me more about your Sonic history. Down. Well, it's just like I, you know, I never really played the game. I wasn't very much of a uh, a gamer in my youth. Um, mm-hmm. I knew about Sonic. I knew he was in Smash Bros. I, I knew about that in general. Uh, I, when Sonic Boom came out, I watched a lot of people playing it because I heard it was bad and I was curious. Um, I watched a lot of zero punctuation videos about Sonic games and I recently watched that like two, three hour video about how the animation in Sonic games has updated over time, which I highly Mm -hmm. recommend. Um, but, uh, yeah, I basically had very little exposure to the character beyond just kind of general pop culture-ness, um, before I watched that movie. So I was not expecting to like it. And then I did. (laughs) Yes, I so I have a bit more of a history with Sonic, but also somehow less because I've consumed Sonic media in three forms in my life, and all of them have sort of been inadvertent. Mm-hmm. The first was in a series of ten issues of comics that were not sequential that we picked up at a thrift store one time. Huh. Because there's a run of Sonic comics that are like very edgy and serious, and he has like a chipmunk girlfriend, and I oh, could not tell God. you the plot, but I know that the echidnas were all dying out in it. Oh that was wait, my wait! First exposure to Sonic. I've heard about that. Yeah. I've actually heard yeah. that that arc like. There's something about how the guy who wrote it is, like, on really bad terms with, like, the rest of Sonic Team now, so they don't have the rights to use any of those arcs because he's keeping them. That explains a lot. <laughs> I think it's, it's like, <laughs> Ken Penders or something is the name of the writer. I, I, Chat's mm. got to help me out on this. I don't want to, like, slam yeah, somebody. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the chipmunk dated Sonic. Um that was my first exposure, and those comic issues lived in, like, the bathroom, and then I think me and my brothers both read um, all of those issues. It's, so, it's, like, three pieces of media in our bathroom of our childhood home. It was one Bionicle novel, ten issues of Sonic the oh my God. comics, and, like, I think a, a, a book on all the first ladies that my mom kept in there. I think you were uh, sharing a bathroom that... with my cousins, who had the exact same lineup, <laughs> or at least the Bionicles. Mm, did they also live in South Philly? That checked out. No. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um my second exposure was because, uh, of course, I was a four kids kid and that that was the only cartoons we got to watch outside of like PBS mm-hmm. when we were younger because we just didn't have cable. Um, and Sonic X was airing at that time, which had the song that went, gotta go faster, faster, oh, yeah. faster, faster, Sonic X. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> uh, and that show, I remember, it was fun. Uh, they went to space in that. So we're once again talking about the moon on this. <laughs> Hell yeah. Three for three on people going to the moon. Yeah. Yeah, and that was like my first exposure to I think the wider Sonic cast really because outside of that show I didn't really understand who anyone was. Um, and then my third exposure to Sonic the Hedgehog pre-watching the movie was one Wii game, Sonic and the Secret of the Rings, oh, which was the one where no! it was the, <laughs> the storybook <laughs> collection, <laughs> where um, an older neighbor of us gave them us my me and my brother some old Wii games, and he's like, "Here, have the Sonic game," and then we played only that one, oh, my uh, and God. then. Two years ago, <laughs> at least the Sonic 
<laughs> Hedgehog movie. And uh, I tried to dwell on all of my childhood knowledge to pool it to see if I could catch any Easter eggs. And, uh, and uh, yeah, honestly, I'm surprised by how much I enjoy that movie. They has yeah. a fun bit at the beginning where it's almost like a high fantasy escape scene. Yeah. No, yeah, that With was Sonic's rad. adopted owl mother. Yeah, that I don't think she's canon, but that was pretty. Yeah, rad. I, she's she has the flavor of the comics, I, the ten issues of the comics I read, <laughs> but I don't remember her character specifically. But again, I only read ten issues, ten non sequential issues of the comics. Right. So I can't speak for whether they appeared somewhere else. Yeah. Um. I mean, I knew about sort of the plot. I mean, everyone knows the basic mm-hmm, premise, mm-hmm. and honestly. Look, if you went into the Sonic movie expecting anything but an utter disaster, you're a liar. Everyone was yes. like, this is going to be a total tire fire. <laughs> when it first came out and the trailer was such a nightmare and Sonic looked horrifying, we were all like, all right, this is going to be one for the history books. It's like, yeah. there has never been a good- It was hot off the heels of cats. Yeah. Yeah. That too. That maybe is why they changed it. Mm-hmm. They were like, let's mm-hmm. yeah. We see what happened like, over there. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> CGI fur is difficult. Yeah, but also like I can, I can kind of see what happened. I, I feel like what happened uh-huh. is they didn't have enough fresh eyes on the project. You know, like because mm. yes. it's any time you're working on something too much, you will stop being able to see it. Like, like mm-hmm. you'll you'll mm-hmm. if you were one of those 3D modelers, you were definitely just focusing on how his quills were clipping or like if you were getting the rendering engine on the eye shine correct and then right. when the trailer drops and everyone's like hey uh did you guys know that this thing looks like some kind of nightmare homunculus <laughs> they'd be like ah fuck it totally does <laughs> and like yeah obviously no, you know, sure. it was a lot of extra work to remodel him but like it was a very good decision like, i don't think the vocal performance would have been able to make him lovable if he looked like he was gonna eat your skin um Yes. And also it made the color balance better. There's a lot of stuff about that. Like just the, the colors are more vibrant, but also kind mm-hmm. of he sort of fits in his environment. And really that movie only works because Sonic is really cute and fun. And uh, Donut Guy. And Jim, yeah. Jim Carrey is acting his little heart out. <laughs> well, in like one yeah, of those... but I, I feel like they didn't has... even need to direct him. They were just like. No, they said, hey, do you want to play this egg based villain? And he said, oh, do I get to um, be Jim Carrey? And they said, yes, absolutely. And then he nailed it because he was just doing the same role he did in a lot of 90s stuff. Yep, yep. Um, In a slightly cooler looking outfit than usual. Um, (laughs) That's debatable. Well, sorry. Black and red is kind of an aesthetic of mine. Uh, But Mm. I think the main thing is that Donut Cop Guy was fun. And he is a really, really good supporting actor. I feel so bad for that man. James Mars... James Marsden. Right, Marsden. Marsters or Marsden. One of them is the other guy who played that guy on Buffy. But I couldn't remember which was yes. it. Uh, like... Marsden is the one who played Tom Watch on uh, Sonic. Right. And he is so good at being a secondary character in someone else's story. <laughs> I feel mm-hmm. so bad for this man. Like, he's, you know, he's handsome. He's charismatic. He feels like leading man material. And instead... He is, like, he's too good as a leading man, so he always has to play some kind of subversion. So he's, like, oh, he's, you know, he's the prince in the story we're doing to subvert fantasy tropes. Or, uh, he's mm-hmm. he's Lois Lane's new boyfriend, who I'm sure she's <laughs> gonna go steady with for the long term. Or, um, I don't know, man. He's just, he's really solid at that. Uh, and yeah. I think that movie wouldn't have worked if he weren't fun and his dynamic with Sonic weren't fun, and, um, yeah, no, it was weird. It's such a basic yeah. movie, and it's entirely sold on the strength of the characters. Yeah, I think it was kind of refreshing in a way that it was such a simple plot, because it's, mm. um, I don't know if it's because I was hot off the heels of watching Cats and I had very low expectations for any sort of CGI animal <laughs> character, or because I was in a weird place watching movies at that time, but I, it was very nice to just have a, 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 solid character dynamic that we followed for pretty much the whole movie and while there was a little bit of like ring space nonsense going yeah. on not so much that you couldn't follow it like if you looked at the movie and you realized what you were watching um it wasn't too hard to just kind of catch yourself up with whatever lore was going on because right. there was very minimal lore which i very much appreciated um yeah, based on no. how much investment I wanted to have in that. <laughs> no, definitely. I also think that, like, um, 
that movie works if you don't know anything about Sonic. And that movie mm-hmm. works maybe not as well if you know too much about Sonic because... Oh my god, I can't believe we've talked about the Sonic movie this long and not talked about the casting decisions for the sequel. I'm sorry, continue Oh yeah, we'll, we'll get there, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but it's just that, like, Sonic, like most modern comics, has way too many canons happening at once. And it's like, mm-hmm. no matter what you do, it's going to be non-canon in some other timeline. So I feel like, you know, a lot of people just looked at this and were like, oh, it's yet another version of Sonic. That makes sense. You know, they they, they were already doing multiverse stuff when they did Sonic Forces in with uh, with... That Sonic from another dimension showing up. Um, and uh, yes. so it's like, it's fine. But also, like, I feel like if you're really into the Sonic canon, you're going to watch this movie and be like, oh, this is ridiculous. I can't believe they're indicating that Sonic and Tails are not lifelong friends. How dare they? It's like, guys, calm down. It's fine, actually. <laughs> um, it's OK. Yeah, it's cool. It's a fun, dumb little movie about friendship. And like, mm-hmm. if you think mm-hmm. it's not, lest we forget. In the finale, it looks like Sonic is dead, and then James Marsden says, this was his home, and he was my friend, and Sonic gets a Super Saiyan power-up, and uh, knocks Robotnik into another dimension, and then hangs out and gets adopted. um, There's nothing all that, uh, what's the opposite of overt? Covert? Subtle. There's nothing subtle about the Sonic movie. They're gonna tell you what you should be feeling. At every point of the time. And for the most part, it's pretty accurate to what you're feeling. Yeah. And I like that it doesn't make you think too hard about the Sonic universe. Because the minute I start thinking about the Sonic universe is the moment I lose investment in the Sonic universe. Yeah, yeah. Basically, all I care to know about Sonic is Sonic. He has friends sometimes. He's got to go fast. He's a bad guy with eggs. And it's like, that's that's what we got. We got Sonic. We got friends. Mm -hmm. We got bad guy. Mm -hmm. We got eggs. And then... We got Tails. And then Hell yeah. we got Idris Elba. <laughs> I I have I'm still so there was like a week of just absolutely insane media things that I learned all at once. Also, and one of the one of those Thank you. Thank you. Yay! Oh. One so of the things I learned is yes. that um Dylan Sprouse is gonna be in a wuxia based on the Puccini opera uh Turandot, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, and then immediately after that, I learned that Idris Elba, because he tweeted out a picture <laughs> of Knuckles <laughs> doing the Arthur oh, hand meme. <laughs> like, wait, this can't possibly be real. Surely someone has photoshopped this and tweeted it out. Is Jabuki back at it? But no, no. I was kind of hoping Elba it was going to be Dwayne Rock actually... Johnson, but I will also accept Idris Elba. <laughs> I'm in, so I'm genuinely excited for this because a Idris Elba is wonderful in everything he touches, but oh, yeah. it almost seems to me like they're reverting back to the uh, Knuckles that I grew up with, which was the Sonic X like edgy, angry, uh, angry Lancer type, yeah. <laughs> Lancer before they type invented Knuckles. Shadow, yeah. Before they invented Shadow, before he sort of started getting himbo eyes, as we discussed in the previous stream. <laughs> um, I mean, and, this does just... mean that it's still open to cast Dwayne The Rock Johnson as Shadow the Hedgehog. I mean, <laughs> is it a cursed idea? No, it's the best idea. <laughs> Dwayne The Rock Johnson is a solid voice actor. And the, oh God, he sorry. Is. Tangent again. Uh, I might need to rename this to Transformers time, but it's going to be real quick. Uh, he's oh, in man. the pilot of Transformers Prime as, mm. uh, oh fuck, what's his name? Um whatever he dies so it doesn't really matter uh uh he gets killed by starscream to show that starscream is serious in this show uh but Mm -hmm. then there's an episode later that's a full flashback uh and instead of getting dwayne the rock johnson back because clearly he was kind of expensive they got a guy who kind of sounds like him. it was like they thought they were safe they thought they were okay by casting him for only five on-screen minutes before murdering him but no 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 oh fantastic he's still crazy yeah, you know, I just, I lo- I've always loved Knuckles. He's always been one of my favorite characters. So I'm excited to see him in the movie because there's absolutely no way that this could go poorly for me now that he's being voiced by Idris Elba. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but I do wonder, like, who the best fan, like, Dwayne Cliff Rock Jumper. Johnson. Cliff Jumper. His Shadow. name is Cliff Jumper. Thank you, chat. <laughs> sorry, go on. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just got a, a text from one of the Greens asking me why Professor Layton was a B-tier detective. And we don't have time to, we, we can't rehash that. Watch the VOD. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, no, um, I'm interested to hear, like, 
who you else you would consider fan casting as Shadow. Because while I think mm. that Dwayne The Rock Johnson is certainly a talented voice actor, I don't know if his voice is the one that I hear in my head when I picture, like... Because in my mind, Shadow is like a mall god from 2008. <laughs> and I don't know if I can see Dwayne The Rock Johnson pulling that off. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. But the question <laughs> is, like, that that's who, that's who Shadow is voiced by in the games anyway. Like, the movies are going to be different. I feel like the best worst casting for Shadow would be getting my man Keith David up in this. Mm. <laughs> Just a real bassy, like, raspy baritone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just, like, give Shadow yeah. all the gravitas that Shadow thinks he has <laughs> and then just go from there. Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. God. Oh, man. Yeah. Sonic time. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly happened. It sure was. Oh, oh my God. God. Uh, oh, chat my God. was asking believe- about monk i believe as a detective from possibly a show also called monk yes uh i haven't seen monk i also haven't seen monk sorry sorry chat um (laughs) oh god antonio banderas would be great terrible as shadow oh my gosh yes wow (laughs) man Man, there's so many excellent shadow so many bad good options i love it I mean, there's really no winning or losing when fan casting a Shadow the, he- Shadow the Hedgehog live action movie. Yeah, I think like the Sonic cinematic universe is one of those things that no matter how you fan cast it, it's going to be excellent. Like, there's no way to really go wrong, because even if you do it incorrectly, it's still correct. And also, there's no way to do it right, because no matter what you do, you're still dealing with fucking Sonic. <laughs> so Exactly. Well, the guy, you know, the um, Sonic the Hedgehog... Uh, was iconically voiced um not in the recent movie but uh in one of the earlier cartoons and i'm looking up exactly which one because i'm gonna mispronounce because again i'm not that familiar with the um original (laughs) original sonic development of course of course is this the one where he was also voiced by urkel yes that's that's what i'm looking for yeah yeah yeah. the one where he's voiced by urkel i think that was the Uh, 90s one that was the 90s one because there was a run in the 90s where like this happened to mark hamill too where like people would be in a really big 90s property and then immediately go on to have an illustrious career voicing iconic characters one of the ninja ninja turtles fell into a similar category but i'm forgetting which one um yeah so you can't really do sonic wrong (laughs) you just gotta do your best what are we talking about (laughs) (laughs) uh sonic i think that's what the chat and the screen says um yeah, let's see. Uh, I mean, there's just a bunch of names flying by in chat. Uh, I oh, I think we're probably kind of detectived out right now. Uh, mostly yeah, because I the names we're popping up. up. On time. Uh, yeah, that too. But also, the names popping up are usually not characters I'm super familiar with. So yeah, I think we're. Um, yes. I think this is a good time to wind things down. Let me just get rid yeah. of this. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Sonic, Sonic time. time. Yeah, just a little. Just, you know, <laughs> let's end where we began. Uh, yeah, while you do that, I will read off our final tier list readings, uh, as I did last time in the Watch Mojo voice. Um, oh because I don't really oh, know no. what else to do with this skill. I've developed <laughs> it uh, over years, over the years, and I don't know what to use it for. I know I want to use it for evil, but I don't quite know how. This is pretty evil. Yes, I thought about, you know, I'm not going to do that. Okay. No, okay. <clears throat> Welcome to the OSP After Dark Detective uh, tier list. Starting out on the S tier, we have Columbo and Hercule Poi- Poirot. <laughs> Poirot. Poirot. Oh, no. Poirot, so damn it. It's Poirot. <laughs> it's French. In the A tier, we have Batman, the Scooby Gang, Sam Vimes, <laughs> Benoit Blanc. <laughs> Benoit oh, Blanc, right. as everybody knows. Benoit Blanc. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, Steve from Blue's Clues, L and Nancy Drew. In the B tier, we have Sean Spencer, Professor Layton, Miss Fisher, Lord Peter Whimsey, Miss Marple, Tintin, Detective D, Father Brown, Jessica Jones, and Eddie Valiant. In the C tier, we have Rick Deckard, Longmire, Dick Tracy, Inspectors, and Agata, the BAU of Criminal Minds fame, Jake Peralta, and John Constantine. And in the D tier, we of course have Dick Gumshoe, Magnum P.I., Elisa, Maza, Eliza? Eliza? No, it's Elisa. Yeah. Elisa. 
Detective Pikachu, Philip Marlowe, Chase Duffin, all French. <laughs> three for three on French names. Chase Wait. Duffin, oh, Inspector Clouseau. Four, which is like a four for four. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at French. I thought that we was pronounced oi for years. Uh, in the E tier, we have Sam Spade. Yusuke. Yusuke. <laughs> Yusuke. 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 You really need to watch the uh, One Piece. <laughs> I do. No, I watched I watched so I did my time. <laughs> yeah, I I got I got all I got all the way up to like chapter like freaking 800 before I dropped off. Are you kidding me? Jesus. All right. Um uh, in the E tier we have Sam Spade, Yusuke, and Mulder and Scully and of course sitting down in our problematic F tier we have Ace Ventura Pet Detective and that is of course the OSP detective tier list as of this stream. And then we also talked about Sonic a bunch. Woo! I hope you all had fun. I'm going <laughs> to hit the end stream button now. Oh. Thanks so much Bye, for raising guys. money for charity. Goodbye, everybody.